to Science Happy Hour during the Glorious Science Week on Twitch. Um, thank you guys for, for watching. Um, you are about to watch the most fun science show that's new on Twitch. Um, it's a little bit like drunk history, but except it's for science. Um, basically, what we'll have is a roundtable discussion with a panel of drunk scientists. Um, and they're going to talk about a bunch of different things today, all under the umbrella of deep time on the cosmic calendar. Um, <clears throat> my name is Kate, and I will be your host this evening, mostly off camera after this initial part. Um, and the rest of the, the time will be, uh, you'll be led by these lovely panelists here. Um, so deep time on the cosmic calendar for us means we're going to be talking about fossils and dinosaurs and the earliest life on Earth, uh, mass extinctions, and all kinds of fun stuff that happened a long, long time ago <laughs> in a land far, far away. Or, also or right here. Yes. <laughs> this galaxy. Yeah, so like this actual galaxy. This actual yeah. <laughs> So, um, so at, with that, I will let these guys introduce to you who they are and what they do, uh, and then we'll start talking about what we're drinking, uh, and then we'll get started. All right, take mm. it away, panelists. Ooh. Hi, um, Ooh, sorry. Ah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Paulina Pshistopa, um, and I am a graduate student at UNM, and um, I'm an archaeologist. Um, I study uh, how um, places are related to how people learn their culture. Um, it's pretty cool. I use computers. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Marion Hamilton. I am also a graduate student at the University of New Mexico. Um, and I am interested in paleoanthropology and I am working on a bunch of work related to how we can use isotopes, which are these chemical measurements, to get ideas about how um, fossil species were using their landscape, how they were moving around the world, what they were eating, where they were living, those kinds of things. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about stuff that's dead, but really cool. Yes. My name is Lee. I got my PhD a few years ago. I primarily study how climate change affects humans. I'm here because when I was a kid, I used to dig dinosaurs. And quick programming note, I would like to introduce you all <laughs> to Mansplainosaurus. <laughs> the purpose of Mansplainosaurus is to help cur curb my mansplaining problem. So anytime I start to run off the rails, <laughs> You will hear that sound. <laughs> <laughs> and it is done out of love and affection <laughs> in order to help a friend with a problem. <laughs> in the uh, meantime, Mansplainosaurus will work on this bowl of popcorn. As long as, we, as long as we're all up front about it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You can we're only clear. fix the problem that is out on the table in front of everybody among trusted That's right. <laughs> all right, thank you guys for that uh, introduction. Uh, what, do, what are we all drinking tonight? So um, mine is clearly labeled, but I am drinking <laughs> the uh, Dogfish Head 60 Minute IPA. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so IPAs are kind mm. of my thing. So cheers to you. I'm drinking this red wine <laughs> that came out of a very pretty box that I don't remember the name of. I think it's a cab. OK, it's delicious. It is a, a tasty boxed wine that is many steps up from like Franzia. <clears throat> so I'm mm, happy with yeah. the red wine this evening. Who, Classy Bathrobe is asking who the other dinosaurs are. Oh, let's introduce our other yeah. dinosaurs. Okay, so we have uh, T-Rex. They don't have jobs like Mansplainosaurus, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, we kind of have one. But they're, they're kind of here for like emotional support. <laughs> um, so we have our T-Rex here. T-Rex has a bit of an accident. For some reason, when they made all these Jurassic Park toys, they decided to show a very bad representation of their insides. <laughs> so you can see his ribs. I believe it was called Dino Damage. Dino uh, Damage. Dino Damage. Um, also Dino Damaged, we've got a Stegosaur here. Yeah. Um, with a tail that I guess you could like oh, kind of wag around. Oh, nice. So Stegosaur says hi. Also has some dino damage. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess we have one other dinosaur with a job, huh? So this is Drunkosaurus, which <laughs> might get slightly more or less used depending on if, Leech, if <laughs> Lee, <laughs> Lee can reach across the table in order to curb our enthusiasm. Um, but he also makes scary sounds, which I don't yeah. know how to operate. Uh, it, take the tail and push it up. Okay. No. Harder. No. Ah, <laughs> see, this is why. There we go. That's how you do it. Yeah. So clearly, anyway. this is for people who are who are not quite as IPA'd. Yeah. Yes. These are our dinosaur <laughs> co-hosts for today. Anyway. What were we doing? All right. Are, what are yeah. We? You were saying oh, what, what is Lee drinking? drinking? I'm, I'm having water. <laughs> <laughs> Lee is not having 
designated driver for the evening. Yeah, yeah. 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 very important thing. Everyone who wants to on, partake yeah. in happy mm-hmm. hour to do. Also, he does not need the alcohol. No, no he's he proud not. Not. I'm good. Perfectly, <laughs> perfectly on par. This is why I need the couple glasses of wine before we can hang out. Yeah. But he'll be just as enthusiastic as the rest of us. <laughs> Felric is saying, sir, is that a T-Rex? Oh, don't worry. He's a support animal. He's my <laughs> emotional support T-Rex. Yeah. Yeah. He can come with me as no. my carry-on yes. in the airplane. That's right. <laughs> no. One quick programming note. The dinosaurs can be declared as anxiety dinosaurs <laughs> if you want to bring them as carry-ons on, on an airline. But unfortunately, most dinosaur enthusiasts used United, which is why we no longer have dinosaurs today. Oh, wow. 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 You gave away the whole punchline. Too, yeah. yeah. too soon. Uh, too soon. Too soon. Wow. Too soon. Wow. Unfortunate. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys for that. Um, welcome to all of these dino damaged dinosaurs <laughs> as well. And welcome to everybody who's watching. Uh, Hi guys. Thanks for spending the end of Science Week with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to go into our first segment for this evening, which is hypothesis testing. All right. All righty. Yay! Hypothesize. So, I get to start with you again. Oh yes. All right. So, so gather your data and make a hypothesis. Yes. So gathering data involves sniffing or <laughs> what is it? Wafting appropriately. Wafting. <laughs> Do we get to try it, try it now? Is that the, also part of this? Okay. Uh, not yet. Not well, first, yet. we have okay. to all make our hypotheses. Mm. Doesn't really smell like much. I will have mm. to consider. Well, okay. So I'm not going to sniff it, but I noticed that there's a bunch of bubbles in it. So mm. I'm going to hypothesize that this is actually a vat of acid. <laughs> I can't smell anything. Mm. <laughs> I got it, it, it smells a, a little scent, bit like a scentless acid. Mm. That's that's our going hypothesis here. It kind of has like a nice fruity flavor, which kind of reminds me of like a watered down um, like hand soap, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, which I don't really want to drink if it's watered down hand soap. But at the exact <laughs> same time, we, we, we will have never to, make we have you to guys test our drink hypothesis. anything that's not edible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's we're getting, nice. we're getting a guest for um, Pepsi Crystal. On the, oh, on the live there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So Great there's hypothesis. Well, that's actually I don't, really I don't know. Is it, that, is it Pepsi Crystal from the Cretaceous period? It might be. Then they said a really good hypothesis. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, timely. I think I'm going to have to, to let's do some, to more, some more evidence. Yes, let's yeah. test it. Tastes like water. <laughs> but I also don't know what Pepsi Crystal tastes like, so... <laughs> I'm going to go with sparkling water. Hmm. <laughs> It's not acid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I feel like that would have been really clear. My <laughs> hypothesis, <laughs> which is a good scientific thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's a bubbly lemon. It tastes like bubbly lemon. Lime. 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 Oh. It is actually a lime LaCroix. Oh. oh. LaCroix. Or, or actually LaCroix. That's a LaCroix. LaCroix. Is it LaCroix? Oh. Say LaCroix. Really? LaCroix. Really? Oh. Yeah. But it sounds way more pretentious to say LaCroix. Yeah, yeah this is LaCroix. true. I, it's yes. always LaCroix. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first time having LaCroix. It's kind of... There you go. Yeah. Now you know. Now you know. <laughs> it's, it's like some sort of weird rite of passage or something. Yeah, yeah. I feel like mm-hmm. I feel like it's really entered hipsterdom in that, in that point it's where like true. everyone has to have had LaCroix at least once. Yes. I wish the audience could see the four, like, <laughs> the four 24 pallets. packs <laughs> of Lacroix that I have, because yeah. we just made a Costco run. Yeah, I feel so. like this, this episode is sponsored by Lacroix. The previous ones right? were sponsored by Chipotle and other places. That's right. So, yeah, yeah, this is a LaCroix, LaCroix episode. call me. <laughs> <laughs> we love your product. It's true. It's true. It's perfect. All right. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to move into our next segment after we did this lovely hypothesis testing Mm -hmm. for today. So this next one is called, This Cool Thing Now Exists. Woo! All right. Yay. Take it away. Cool new things. All right, so our cool thing today is we have a new dinosaur. That we don't have a, no. a dino damaged dinosaur. Of. We have a we, we have, have a, a close approximation. A relative do. of yes. this new dinosaur. Um, so this new dinosaur was discovered this year um, by a paleontologist right here in New Mexico at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, which is an awesome museum. If you ever get to come to Albuquerque, I highly recommend the Museum of Natural History. Um, and his name was Sebastian Dalman. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. <laughs> Um, and this new species is labeled as a Torosaurus, which is a relative of a Triceratops. Um, and was the Torosaurus species was first discovered in 2015. 
Um, and then there were two new excavations done in 2016 and 2017, but we don't know the name of the species yet. They are going to unveil the name of the actual species at a conference later on this month. So this one's a little bit of a cliffhanger. We've got a new torosaur, but we don't know exactly what kind of species it is. Yeah, yeah. No. and it's actually kind of a funny story too, because the only reason why this dinosaur was discovered was because it was in the boxes with the other Torosaurus fragments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this wonderful gentleman, Sebastian Dahlman, found it in there and was like, hmm, this, this doesn't quite different. look right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so then ended up doing those excavations because of it. So mm -hmm. super cool, yeah. like random find. To, you know? any, to any aspiring paleontologists, don't go to the field, go to old museum boxes. <laughs> like, it is a, right? have, you, have you guys ever yeah. been like, behind trope. the scenes in a, oh, a dinosaur okay. museum? Yeah. It's like, have you ever seen that scene in Indiana Jones where you know they put the Ark of the Covenant in the big warehouse? <laughs> yes. That's basically yes. every dinosaur museum. Yeah. And there's yeah. so much stuff that mm -hmm. is yet to be yeah. discovered because when it was dug up, presumably mm -hmm. by dynamite in the 1930s, <laughs> yeah. they, yeah. they didn't understand the yeah. osteology. Dynamite, well not yeah. dynamite. 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 Right. Dynamite. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's a great. It's a. This is, this is, <laughs> like, how, how much time do we got? <laughs> no, but that's that's a great example of like. So um, we think of like paleontology and archaeology as these really big fields that are like out going, going exploring big deserts and doing all these things. But there's so much cool stuff that's just hidden in museums, and no mm -hmm. one's like opened up the box to be like, what new question can I ask about this random yeah. cool thing in this box? Right. Exactly. And it's just like you just need to do that, and that's the future of so many different field archaeology, um, like field field perspective now is going back looking at these collections that people haven't haven't looked at in the, you know 50 years or whatever yeah. and being like hey wait a second this doesn't fit what we thought it was going to be mm -hmm. what can we actually say about this now right. and it's such yeah. an it's a it's such a great thing to see um, and yeah, no, it was awesome, this idea that like, wait a second, these bones just like don't match Triceratops bones. What's going on here? What? Like, how can we find out more about this? One other thing, and like, this is one of those things I read about a few years ago, so I do not want to say this is like 100% scientific fact, but I remember <laughs> there was a lot of discussion about the fact that Torosaur, the relation between Torosaur and Triceratops may not be that they're different species, but that they're different stages in mm, development. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the idea being that, you know, when you, when you, when you find a dinosaur, first off, with Ceratopsians, it's particularly difficult. What's a Ceratopsian? What's a Ceratopsian? The are the, uh, we're, like this guy. These guys. So you've got the bony frill and the horns. That's a Ceratopsian dinosaur. Bony frill? There are horns. lots of Ceratopsian dinosaur species. We typically find only the, the, the skull, and the rest of the body separate from each other. So a oh, lot yeah. of, yeah. it's really hard actually to associate the complete uh, the, the complete osteology of these guys. So there's a lot of debate. Could we, you know, could Triceratops mm -hmm. be a juvenile torso? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, example? that's actually a really great example of um, when we're talking about scientific questions in general, we like to have this idea of like, everything's a new species if we have a new thing, but then we forget that like, oh, wait a second, you know, dinosaurs are animals and animals go through this developmental periods. And so maybe we're not looking at different exactly, species. Maybe exactly. we're looking at different genders, male yep. and female, which might have slightly different expressions as far as their bones are concerned. Yep. Um, or we're looking at, yeah, different life histories. And I think that for a long time, we were just not thinking about, it was just so cool to find this giant fossilized bone. And like, if it was yeah. new and if it was different, it had to be a new species. Yeah. But now we're realizing like, oh, wait a second, we can apply these things that we know about, you know, like modern animals and like um, yeah. put that back into the fossil record. Record and it's really cool. To clarify, this isn't just a dinosaur problem. No, we not have at this all. problem yeah. with yeah. all fossil species, ex like when we get to fossil species that lead up to our own lin lineage of Homo sapiens, we, we have mm -hmm. these problems. These Which problems we'll talk are... about tomorrow on the evolution episode. Yes, yes. Soon. Right? Yeah. So, but tune in tomorrow. Are, problems are persistent through the entire yeah. fossil record, not just dinosaurs. But yeah, but exactly. Yeah. One ceratops, and I have to bring up, there's <laughs> one triceratops specimen that is 50% complete, specifically mm -hmm. the right half. <laughs> so what happened is a triceratops fell was in it some right kind of pond where one half was anoxic <laughs> and the bones only preserved on that half. Mm -hmm. I think it's now in the Tokyo Museum of Natural History. Oh. So it's a really long drive if you want to go see it. But is there a way to drive to Tokyo from here? <laughs> I mean, there has to be, because every time I play Risk, you get to Asia via Kamkachka Peninsula. So, I, I mean, I, it's it's only like a mile. There's actually a point where Russia and America are only a mile apart. Yeah, no. But it's a yeah. set of islands, like way yeah. out there. Yeah. I don't think your car can help Yeah, I don't think, time. yeah. But you could see that. Russia from yeah. someone's house on an island, so. Anyway. <laughs> Seeing is slightly different than drivable, but. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
We've got so some chat got, going on. Got some in chat there. going yeah. on. What's going on here? Take a look. I right. see that the popcorn, the dinosaurs are in fact holding the popcorn hostage. So that's why none yeah. of us can get a bite this because they're all very hungry yeah. and we wouldn't dare <laughs> interrupt their popcorn. I eating. don't want to be attacked by a dinosaur. I mean, it's not so okay. we, we feel like we've been always told that T. Rexes are. Um, carnivorous are going to go after meat, but it's a lie. They go after kettle corn. It's yeah. really their favorite exactly. thing in the whole wide world. Yeah. <laughs> little um, known fact. They really little like maize. Known fact. I, got, I have to interject here. <laughs> C4 plants like maize only come from the Miocene period, so there were no C4 plants during the uh, dinosaur era. Popcorn of so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So right, no corn, right? Yeah. No, no corn, corn at all. No corn. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why they so love it so much because they haven't had no, it before. No, yeah, that's why no they're so cactus, brand new. It's a brand no new, cactus yeah. either. Oh, no. No, they're not hmm. cacti. No. Oh really? Yeah, they're also Didn't from Miocene. New There's Mexico a, would be a sad, sad place without cacti. It would. Yeah, but I mean, back then I it was. Like back, then, back then it was pretty. pretty I feel warm like it was well, back also back like then, under. Back and then also, New Mexico was a sea. That's right. It was underwater. Yeah. yeah. So, also, yeah. wouldn't it? it was it a different then. continent at that point too? No, no, it was. It was okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Yeah. It was but, just under the big. Yeah. yeah there's a. There's a. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I understand that aspect. Right. 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 I started historical archaeology. Like my time span is actually more like two hundred years, but. Oh, carnivore. We carnivore. Have carnivore. Carnivore. Ah, yeah. That's yeah. That's good. That's good. That's that is, that is, that is carnivore. a carnivore. That's Snoopy Dragon. Well done. Yes. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all, all dinosaurs are, are just Loopy Dragons, actually. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Really great observation from Classy Bathrobe. T Rexes kind of are like lizard kangaroos. Mm. Totally true. Like that. Mm. Yeah. They, they just need a like, pouch. I don't mm. know if they would have that pouch, but I, they would. They would they're not, have that they're pouch. not got, as good as boxing. See, yeah. I always call. <laughs> that's I would, true. I would have accepted bird kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah they're, they're actually much, closer to birds than, yeah. than lizards. Yeah. But yeah. but yeah, that's a crazy thing to think about. That a movie that I saw when I was like five years old, Jurassic Park, was actually talking about something that was like like preeminent in science and then was confirmed. Yeah. Actually, yeah. the whole like avian hypothesis that was yeah. like, no, they yeah. were on the edge like, of that. Yeah, they exactly. Totally I'm like, that's crazy. That. Yeah. 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 yeah, the whole yeah. like science fiction, science fact thing to yeah. quote Marvel. Definitely. Um, which is awesome. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah. yes. All right, so I think we're ready to move on to our next segment, which is Discovery. Discovery. All right, we're gonna talk about some new like stuff. Discovery. Okay. On so, the deep time. So deep time discoveries. So it's possibly the oldest fossil evidence of life, which is really cool. Which is really awesome. Super cool. Um, also, it's very strange to think of life in, in this form, actually. So basically, there were these tube-like structures that were found in rocks that are dated to at least 3.77 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're talking like... Billions and billions mil yes. of billions years. Billions with a B. Yes. Yeah, billions and yeah. billions. Like, yes. like, guys, B. The <laughs> amount of money Bill Gates has, but in years. Like, yes. this is crazy. This is, like, super cool. Carl also, Sagan says billions and billions of and stars. Yes. And this is billions and billions of years. Of years. Yes. And of course, the Quebecois, um, it was found in northern Quebec of all places. Which so, is, ils sont francophones. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed, yes. <laughs> the oldest life is actually French. Yes. <laughs> um, and so. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is actually really cool because um, this dating of these um, tube-like early life formations are 300 million years older than the earliest known life. Um, and these um, tube-like structures are supposed to be these um, tiny little um, evidence of life that are usually found Can around... A photo? Yes, a photo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fo uh, found around um, these seafloor thermal vents, which are um, so kind of where like it's like the the crust of the earth meets the seafloor. Yeah. And so basically there's a lot of like hot and cooling stuff that goes on and um, it's a place where like bacteria can grow. Yeah. Um, and so basically we have like the, they're like the imprints of them, right? Yes. Yeah, kind of so the imprints have been fossilized into this. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, an iron oxide mm -hmm. yeah. and it's basically seen as the product of bacterial activity and, or microbial yeah. activity. And this is, a, this yeah. is important to note because at this time there would not have been oxygen mm -hmm. free right. range yeah. on Earth. So yeah. you wouldn't yeah, have exactly. had the oxygen available to oxidize. So basically when we say iron oxide, bike rust. So we have 3.7 billion year old bike rust, which mm -hmm. only could come via a, a life process. In other words, oxygen is what they're expelling out. Mm -hmm. This is so far in the past plate tectonics might not have been working yet. There might mm -hmm. not have been continents. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the Earth had only recently cooled. The atmosphere would have made mm -hmm. Venus look like a vacation destination. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is because like, so the 3.77, because I think um, yeah. the estimate for how old the Earth is is only like 4.4, 4. 4. 4. yeah, yeah 4.6 billion years ago. So it's like, 
Yeah, there's a billion of years between yeah. Yeah, um, know, when no the Earth deal. was formed, but when, yeah, NBD, it's fine. Um, and when this first life happens, but it's still like, it's so much, you know, kind of crazy old actually to think about like yeah. how yeah. long ago. And like yeah. really, um, as far as kickstarting life, that a billion years is not a very long time to, yeah. to no. do something yeah, exactly. that sort of yeah. complicated and yeah. random and, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, built Yeah, when we think about the idea that this is all like, like a probabil- <laughs> probabilistic thing to have happened, it's actually like, oh yeah, yeah. a billion years probably. Ain't we'll nobody got that. deep time for that. You're <laughs> absolutely right. Scoop therapy, you got it. <laughs> but then also the idea that like we actually have evidence for it too, because it's possible that we might have had you know yeah. earlier life. But the fact that like the the probability of us having this amazing evidence for life starting all like like 3.7 billion years ago and us having that evidence to prove back is kind of, is like, that's amazing. Let's start with how many 3.7 billion year old rock outcrops have survived. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so few, few, exactly. So you think about the percentage of Earth's surface back then. Mm -hmm. It had to have been buried, Mm -hmm. subjected to metamorphic pressure deep in Mm -hmm. the Earth's crust, and it didn't destroy the no, microbiosphere. It, yeah, like, yeah, it didn't right. get rid of the yeah. yeah, no, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but that's like, like the really cool thing about deep time stuff is that there are so many different ways we can get back at it, but it's also this super random process because you never know mm-hmm. what's yep. going to preserve. Right, and it's what's going to get, what beautiful thing is going to get crushed, what beautiful thing you're going to be able to find in the next outcrop. Mm-hmm. And the super cool thing about this one, to tie it back into those of you who were watching last week, is that these types of chemotrophic... Um, so like making making life based on chemicals, not really necessarily based on carbon dioxide and oxygen like we do it today. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of stuff that we might be finding on these extraterrestrial planets, um, like Enceladus and these other sorts of areas where you don't have oxygen, you don't have carbon yeah. dioxide, mm-hmm. but you do have these sort of vents deep in these oceans on these other planets. So mm-hmm. this is the kind of life that we might be looking for when we're looking for extraterrestrial life too. Mm-hmm. And it started here first. Yep. Mm-hmm. In in Quebecois, in Quebec province. <laughs> and fun fact, the last interesting thing to happen in Quebec province. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> this is where we're the I have, gallery I have some throwing popcorn right now. Deep, deep burn. We're gonna have some Quebecers. <laughs> There are going to be some Quebecers who are super pissed about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the technical term, Quebecers? Quebec-wa. I always think of the yeah. I think of Quebecois. Quebec-wa. Quebec-wa. Yeah. Oh. I like Quebecers. I, like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I always go, we I, don't get to pick that stuff. Yes. <laughs> I grew up calling them Quebecers, but yes. you know, whatever. Yes. They'll yell. It'll be fun. We yeah, have, a, we have a lovely one. question from oh, Scoop Therapy. Mm, how could we determine if... Panspermia. So this idea of panspermia. What is panspermia? Um, oh! There we go. There's, this is yeah, panspermia. That's panspermia. Okay, so panspermia is coming in. Panspermia <laughs> is the idea that life you have came now been to populated Earth with life. via a comet or an oh, asteroid, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. So the idea is is that there at some point life started in the universe. Could have been even older Anywhere. than mm-hmm. the history mm-hmm. of Earth, and that a bit of life made it to Earth and managed to survive. This the problem is. Is it's not really testable. In fact, oh, yeah. only one no, way yeah, it's to not, test it yeah, it's one of those. Is if you get something from space with bacteria on it. Mm-hmm. Right. Because really, the fossils from Quebec, from, from Quebec province, can we call them Quebecois bacteria? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, 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 our Quebecacteria? Ke- our Quebecteria. Quebecteria. <laughs> they, um, they would, like, if they came from an asteroid, say, a <laughs> uh, half billion years earlier, we would not be able to tell the difference between that and life originating on Earth. So unfortunately, it doesn't test that hypothesis, mm-hmm. but as you push, but here's the thing, right? If you follow panspermia <laughs> as a hypothesis, mm-hmm. life is common in the universe. Hmm. If you follow, right. it started within a billion years of a deeply inhospitable Earth, life is also common in the universe. Yeah. Because right. it would have formed in an environment If it could that, form this yeah. quickly here, or if it exactly. came here from somewhere else, both indicate that yeah. we mm-hmm. probably are going to find life somewhere yeah. else, or at least that it probably exists, whether so, or not we mm-hmm. find it. Really, <laughs> I mean, the earlier you see life on Earth, the more likely it is that there's, there's life elsewhere, outside mm-hmm. of Earth, yes. But also, it's not all that likely we're going to have a good conversation with that life. In fact, mm-hmm. it's probably going to not do much besides oxidize iron. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. No. I feel like that, the panspermia thing reminds me a lot of um, kind of when we talk about the idea of life being on other planets, the way that it was kind of portrayed in Battlestar Galactica, actually. <laughs> this idea of like parallel development of civilization yeah, and suddenly yeah. like, oh, wait a second, we, mm-hmm. you know, occurred on multiple planets. And it mm-hmm. really, that, it's a really cool idea, but it kind of brings up something with science that, um, that some people, I think, forget about is this idea 
idea of like falsif falsifiability. Yeah. And it's like with a with a theory like that, it's actually really hard to falsify because we it can't is. it's we can't really get at this sort of evidence to really talk exactly, about it. Exactly. Exactly. So we were talking about this right before the camera turned on. It's not <laughs> about being doing good science is not about being right. Mm -hmm. It's about doing something or proposing something that you can then go and test and prove wrong. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you go and you have this idea that is testable and you could prove that idea wrong and you fail to prove it 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 wrong, fail to prove it wrong then you have what scientists call a theory. And mm -hmm. then you've got, you know, something that you can really can't you can't technically say like, oh, we've proved it, yeah. but you've built up this litany of evidence by failing to disprove it mm -hmm. that scientists rely on as a as a Proof, and how is that so different than what the colloquial meaning of theory is? So colloquially, we say theory is like, oh, this crazy idea that I have. I have this theory that aliens crash landed mm -hmm. in Roswell, New Mexico. I have this theory that if I wear my special underpants, then my mm -hmm. football team wins every Sunday. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what a theory is there, which is really different from a scientific theory, which is this idea that I had that I failed to prove wrong and failed to prove wrong through rigorous, careful testing mm -hmm. over and over again, not just by me, but by all of these other yeah. people yeah. who are like probably out to prove me wrong because they want me to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and that sort of lack of proof against becomes our proof for. Yeah, I think also the colloquial theory is kind of what scientists really consider a, hypo a, a hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely. So this right. idea of like, um, if I wear this underwear, my football team always wins. It's more like, if I wear this underwear, then my football team always wins. But mm -hmm. it's more like something you're testing because if your football team like loses once when you're wearing that underpants, then that no longer can be true. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, this really great example of it's, right. it's actually something that is really falsifiable. Absolutely, yeah. it's and a great really, hypothesis. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah. a great hypothesis. And I think that like kind of getting people to understand that difference in knowledge between mm -hmm. kind of what you're colloquially talking about as far mm -hmm. as science and what as scientists we're talking about and like how we use our words is a really important thing to differentiate mm -hmm. and understand that when we're kind of talking with people who don't always know our words um, to <laughs> Um, and not in a bad way, our jargon, our jargon. yeah, it's exactly. like when we want to talk with people who don't know our jargon, we need to explain ourselves and it's yeah. really important. Yeah. This it's is super of course, important. Jargon is like really annoying when you're in a group of people where you can't, yeah. you can't even really communicate. Yeah, you yeah. can't enter the conversation. Totally language. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple of really good points here that this only works unless <laughs> you have better underpants than the other team does. <laughs> it doesn't work if they have better underpants than yeah, you. Yeah, this is true, yeah. Um, a really nice cut. really it's only really valid if everyone rooting for your team wears those same special underpants. Right. So. Yeah, this yeah. is true. It's, it yeah. becomes tough. Everybody to has to be doing the exact <laughs> same test of these underpants or else it's not really valid. Not really as far as, a, yeah, it's not real science. Oh, <laughs> so Classy Bathrobe has a really good point here too. Maybe the underwear worked based on his diet, but if the diet changed, then the magic leaves. This is a really interesting mm -hmm. thing because it's an example of a spurious correlation. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. or right. confounding variables right. that you did mm -hmm. not yeah, account yeah. for. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. the interaction between your underwear and the diet, and the not diet. necessarily right. one or the other. And, and, yeah. and the key thing is you want to make an argument that you can disprove with data. And yep, the, exactly. The, the person I want to highlight here who I like a lot is Lamarck because mm -hmm. Lamarck came up with an who absolute... Is Lamarck? He who is Lamarck and what did he do? Rap. He gets yeah, a terrible rap and, and, and deservedly so because yeah. his idea was wrong. Yeah. But, 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 who was, but Lamarck, Lamarck was... Lamarck went, lived during the French Revolution and he came up with an idea for speciation that was based on... What speciation? Uh, the creation of new species. Kay. So the base idea... Nice. Lamarck's idea is... Well giraffes are a great example. Paulina's got it on the yeah. jargon. <laughs> <laughs> so why we, do, we brought it up. We need to actually address it. So why do giraffes have long necks? Right? Because they try really hard to eat the long, long like, leaves, right? leaves so yeah. Because the, the leaves are up on the tree. Yeah. So it's like, I'm the super giraffe short. tries like, to I'm reach, stretching I want and leaves. that's how it got a long neck. <laughs> and so that was Lamarck's idea. It was stupid. It was wrong. But <laughs> it was falsifiable. It's a little and it bit. Led to, yeah. It's, a, it's more nuanced than that. And like, so, so I've actually <laughs> heard some stuff recently that says that, so yes, everybody kind of has this idea that he was saying that yeah. giraffes get long necks because they had to reach up to the trees. Um, but like, that's a oversimplification, which, you know, of course, happens all the yeah. time. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Anytime you, know, you put probably, a complicated idea out right. there, you mm -hmm. run and the risk of it being That is not how selection works, which we'll get to especially tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. But the thing is, we have things like epigenetics now where we're actually seeing developmental changes that can be heritable. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. like, mm -hmm. so some mm -hmm. of the epigenetic stuff that's come out is like, it's certainly not Lamarckian, mm -hmm. but it's it basically shows that Lamarck might not have been like as totally, mm -hmm. totally yeah. Yeah. yeah as, so, as everyone but, thinks. But so a good summary this, of what yeah. epigenetics are. Yes, they we need are. To do that too. Yeah, epigenetics. They're kind of, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, they're kind of like 
there are certain sorts of things that you do in your lifetime that can kind of affect and influence yeah. what gets passed on in your in your descendants. Is that yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. So they're like they're kind of Lamarckian in the sense, mm -hmm. sort um, of. Yeah, y sort of. But they're well, not. It's, what it's it, it's it's predicated on the fact that these things that actually can happen throughout your development are actually heritable. That's right. the whole yeah. point. And so it's kind of like finding now is that we have these um, famine studies where someone who is pregnant during a famine, their baby has sorts of yeah. all sorts of mm -hmm. problems, and then we can actually see those problems in multiple generations mm -hmm. now. Uh, down the line, yeah, and that's all coming from that initial mm -hmm. famine, and so yeah. those, that's that's one example of it yeah, actually no, right. being heritable. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's a really interesting sort of um, definition of the kind of nature nurture debate that we'll probably you know touch on. Like, that sounds like an episode that we're going yeah, yeah, exactly. to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But this whole, whole idea, idea of like what kind of happens sort of like objectively without <laughs> our influence versus yeah. the things that we can control. So this idea that like what you do when you're pregnant or before you have children can influence what gets passed on, and that's a kind of or like horrible right. external stuff that happened to your mother might yep. affect your child. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. Like these and things, these things can't be passed. Yeah, and, and, the, but, and the mechanism, if I'm not mistaken, is like something methylization of the proteins of that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, basically, it's all the complicated protein synthesis stuff around mm -hmm. the ability to carry gene from point A to protein. Essentially, mm -hmm. is what we're talking about here. Very, 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 very detailed. On the larger point, I mean, but even at that, epigenetics isn't playing the central role in evolutionary history, right. mm -hmm. and not compared to selective, which again mm -hmm. is for tomorrow. Oh. Mm -hmm. The yeah. key yeah. thing here is, in the larger debate, a guy like Lamarck was wrong. That doesn't mean he did not make an important contribution because yeah, he got exactly. people talking about it. Mm -hmm. He inspired guys like Darwin to mm -hmm. go out there and disprove them with an evidence-based mm -hmm. theory. Mm -hmm. The reason I bring this up is for anyone who's an aspiring scientist. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be wrong, mm -hmm. as yeah, long as you phrase yeah. your question in a way that can be falsified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And if you do that well, then you're doing science exactly. well, and you're doing exactly. science a service. Mm -hmm. But Definitely. if you put out an idea that you can't actually test or you can't actually falsify, then exactly. mm -hmm. you're you're just sort of tooting your own horn. And on yeah, the same exactly. And at the same time, if you put an idea that can be that can be falsified, and no one can falsify it, even mm -hmm. though they try really, 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 really hard. That is what, how ideas get elevated to the level of theory. Yes. Something mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. withstood lots and lots of scrutiny. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot Definitely. of people wanting you to be wrong and trying to prove that you're wrong mm -hmm. and not being able to mm -hmm. do so. And then we <laughs> give you the accolade of calling you Yeah, a It's not personal that we want you to be wrong, but we want to make sure that you're definitely yeah. not yeah. wrong before yeah. we think exactly. your idea and is And that, cool. that's good. That's a good mm -hmm. thing. Right. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of yeah. innovation comes out of, the f out of the face of failure. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely. I think exactly. I said that weird. I might be getting a little. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah, no, it's, a, it's the point a, remains. The point yeah. is there. Yeah, I feel like that's um, something like the way that we frame scientific discoveries. That even yeah. to a certain degree, even the way that we talk about that idea of discovery as if it's mm. proving something, and it's like, well, maybe we should rephrase how we say that so that people understand that it's more about like, like disproving failure. It's right. true. Or, like, yeah, it's a really right. good point actually, mm -hmm. and that that kind of plays into the fact that we almost never see negative results. Yeah, published. exactly. Yeah. Because science. they don't they don't seem as cool as yeah, the positive right. not results. Not as sexy. You can't yeah. write some crazy sensational right. you know, yeah. soundbite from it. Right. It was like this right. didn't it's work. <laughs> I tried to do this thing and I couldn't do it. Like, ah, yeah. I was that's so actually, wrong. But it's, but it's so, so important. important. Yeah. 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 It's because if, if like 15 important. other people have that same exact idea down the road and right. they don't have this publication right. to mm -hmm. reference, they're going right. to do the exact same thing and yeah. have the same result. And then if yeah, exactly. those people have tried and failed at the same right. something, mm -hmm. then like that means something. That collective failure to, mm -hmm. to, to prove something or to disprove something means something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but because exactly. we can't get that stuff published in journals or in journals mm -hmm. that people yeah. pay attention mm -hmm. to, it becomes yeah. a problem. Yeah. And that's a, a that's a publication issue too. That is a publication that's a, and that's it's a publishing issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cassie Braffo, congrats congrats, sure. you're wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we do need a congrats you're wrong badge. It's important. It's true. I think this was actually something that was really cool that was touched on on this like the our original point when we started talking about this. The um really old life thing is that um they were they they found this evidence and the advisor of the person who was actually like finding all this evidence is like, dude, no the way, no way, this isn't possible. Like yeah. you need to find some more stuff to back up this claim because yeah. this is like ridiculous and absurd actually. Like you're gonna push this boundary of when life started on earth back 300 million years. Like you have to be sure about this. Yeah. yeah. And so it was a great thing to kind of have that relationship of like, no, not one, one piece of evidence is not enough. 
Yeah. You right. need to go back and yeah. test and yeah. test and, and test. And, and, and then some people are questioning this this tube like mm -hmm. fossil finding. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, as they should. As Which, they should. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Again, that's the point. Yeah, that's right. yeah exactly. Thing. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. But no. sorry, I, I think. I oh no, yeah, no. It's so no, it's totally true. It's just, it's um it's a great thing to see in um even a like a, a public science thing is to acknowledge that need for like multiple maybe not always multiple lines of evidence but like rigorous testing Absolutely. before you come to a particular conclusion. Yeah. Absolutely. Melvin Mills says that. No one gets that excited about negative results, and you're right, but it's really sad that it's that way. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. We need to incentivize getting that excited about negative yeah. results yeah. because it's still knowledge being generated, mm -hmm. and by dismissing all of the knowledge that we gather that happens to be a mm -hmm. negative result, mm -hmm. we're really doing everybody a disservice. Yeah, so that's true. We need to like we need to hand out more congrats, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. no, the, um, I think there's <laughs> even there's even like a line of philosophy of science that's actually interested in kind of dismantling the scientific method in the sense that um, rather than like going out and observing things and then creating hi your hypothesis that you literally generate any hypothesis that comes to mind, like I am standing in the shower and I think these things happen, just so that we can create the knowledge to disprove every possible thing that happens. And it's kind of like, it's kind of crazy like, to a certain down degree. A really bad like, rabbit hole yeah, really quickly. Like, like, don't write to NSF about that sort of thing. But at the exact same time, that idea of thinking about like not wanting to limit our questions because sure. we create science through negative results sure. is also sure. really important. All right, what's All next? Right. All right, next right. thing. So, okay. Yeah, so our next segment is a fun one. Woo! And it relates to our uh, main discussion for tonight. Um, and that is, let's pronounce some shit. Woo! Woo! I All right. pronounce the shit. Actually, so no, so in this segment, <laughs> each of our lovely panelists is going to try and pronounce some crazy word that comes from the article that we're going to talk about in our main discussion here. So, um, all right, let's let's take it off with Paulina here. Woo! Oh, okay. We <laughs> we just <laughs> practiced. practiced. <laughs> and now I forgot, and so I'm going to pronounce this the way that I pronounced it when I was um, reading this article, and I'm pronouncing it Chikshulub, or whatever, close to that. Um, woo! That's the word. Um, mm -hmm. So this is we talked about it in the. Um, we'll talk about it later. Um, this is the, basically the name for the giant asteroid Me meteor crater. Crater. Yeah. crater. The big thing Caldera. that Caldera, like hit. Yeah, there is a giant depression yeah. <laughs> in the Earth that was created by a thing that fell from the sky, and it killed a lot of stuff on Earth. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about that later. But I think that this is just a, a name, actually, just a, mm -hmm. um, probably a Mishtek or um, um, Mayan or Aztec related name mm -hmm. for the thing relating to where it was actually found. So Yes, which I have pictures for later. Oh, yay! Excellent. Yay! Big holes. It's awesome. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Marion. <sighs> Gondwanatharian. Oops. Gondwanatharian. I'm guessing this is related to Gondwana land which is one of the names for one of the ancient continents that existed on yeah. Earth before we all broke up. And Gondwanatharian <laughs> makes me think that it is an animal that used to live on Gondwana land. Yes. So there is Gondwanatharian. It's, it's mm -hmm. on the screen. I have it on is the it screen. Yeah. Gondwanatharian. <laughs> is it a mammal-like reptile? It, it is a mammal-like reptile. So I thought. All right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Way to bring it I'm, home, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. Thanks, Lee. Right. Right. Whoa. <laughs> as, Excellent. As Dirachid? As directed? As I've never heard of that before. Is as, as, it as directed? Is it like the first arachnid? You're, you're adding <laughs> you're adding an extra vowel. I yeah, think. I think it's just as as darkened. As darkened. As darkened. Dark 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 Maybe it wasn't I too no light. I have no idea what that is. It as wasn't very bright. It was as darkened. <laughs> Fired. <laughs> Speaking of fire, <laughs> giant. <laughs> <laughs> as dark as dark I've already gotten a couple call outs in the chat about your puns. I don't know about this. You deserve some popcorn. <laughs> if, you need, if you need popcorn to be thrown at Paulina and her puns, please let us know. Yeah. We are happy to comply. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Punlina over there, done. Yeah, it's, it's actually Punlina pun at this yeah. point. Okay. <laughs> 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 but but yeah, know, so as, as dark is yeah. is another is another one of the it's it's actually one of the the lizards that lizards. actually went extinct. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, um, oh, okay. the, it's one of the ones that were that uh, is in the article we're going to talk about. Okay, so. right. awesome. is, is it a true lizard or is it a? You know, I'm not. What is a true lizard, sure. Lee? Tell well, us yeah. what a true I mean, lizard is. Uh, well, I'm not as good with uh, <laughs> yeah. herpetology, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. Let's, yes. for Let's say it's a reptile. I mean, so like. 
uh, a lizard has specific like femur connecting to the hips ratio, body movements, etc. So like an alligator what would you be mean, a like lizard. femur connecting to the hips ratio. I think like, like the, the legs, angle. like the, the legs ratio, oh, the, angle. the, the, the okay, legs so the, play out okay. like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, not not my not my specialization. But I don't <laughs> Hashtag know. Not my I actually have no idea when the true lizards began. I don't know if they would have been around before the Permian Triassic. Wait, right, so, you so you're talking about defining true lizards based yeah, yeah, yeah. on this angle like, between femur and um, if we found it today. We call Which it is a, a long yeah. bone. Femurs yeah. are long bones. Yeah. So well, I guess one thing, reptiles are really general, right? So like technically, reptiles include all mammals, all birds, Wait, why all is lizards. Why is yes. that? Why is that? Yeah. They, Explain why that's so, why is so that the truth. This call it's a and I hope it's been a long time since evolution of biology, but it's a polyphyletic group. What does that what mean? That, What's polyphyletic? Well what it means, so let's say, let me put it this way. Let's say this guy gives birth to two babies. This guy is over here. This, can you hold that? Can you hold that? <laughs> All right, so, and then this guy is over here. Okay. And then this so guy. I had these two babies. Okay. Yeah, exactly, boom, boom. boom. Here's another and then this guy evolves into technology. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm really concerned about now, what we're portraying here, but okay. Now, this okay. Stegosaurus is very shiny because it's partly green. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need another so dinosaur? It has a little bit of trade. primordial earth on yeah. it. Yeah, okay. that's, that's appropriate. I think so, that's okay. If we're evolving into technology, we can yeah. start at primordial. Yeah. So yeah. the point is, is cyborg that dinosaurs. I would take these guys as obviously a different evolutionary group, right? Mm -hmm. But it's technically within the same division between these two guys because they're all related. Exactly. So okay. the point is, is mammals evolved from reptiles. That's the Therian group we just mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. okay. Dinosaurs also evolved from reptiles. If we take lizards, mm -hmm. turtles, and crocodiles, the last common ancestor they share is also shared with mammals and birds. Mm -hmm. Because mammals and slow birds... Slow down, slow down. Yeah, Falric, Falric is taking notes. Because, oh, yeah. because mammals I and birds... I have to go back yeah. to, the to the last slide. Right. You know. Because mammals and birds like are so different <laughs> from each other, we tend to think of them in their own essential categories, but if we're being honest evolutionarily, they're mm -hmm. all subgroups of reptiles. Mm -hmm. Right. So we yeah. start at reptiles, day. and then reptiles turn into more reptiles, but also mammals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, they're all sort of under this same, like you can trace them all back to this same exactly. other species. Exactly. You could even make the same argument that at the end of the day, we're all still amphibians, because mm -hmm. reptiles are a group of, you mm -hmm. know. We're yeah, also all still primordial yeah. ooze. Mm -hmm. Like how far back yeah. do we But the difference yeah, is, you know? is we have a reasonable expectation that the first ancestor of reptiles branched out into everything else. That mm -hmm. there wasn't two separate evolu evolutionary events that led to mm -hmm. reptile-like things. Mm -hmm. But reptiles themselves, I mean, obviously birds and uh, uh, birds and mammals and dinosaurs are great examples. These are all mm -hmm. subgroups of animals that came mm -hmm. out of reptilia, mm -hmm. um, but share that ancestor with crocodiles mm -hmm. before the split with lizards. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're By all the way, before reptiles. we keep going, yeah. um, we had some bits come in from Hose Beats. Woo! Yeah. Hose Beats! Yay! Yeah, thank you! 100 bits. And awesome. I'm very, very, very thrilled to say that these are our first ever bits. Woo! Yes. <laughs> and this is because just this week we were invited to join the Twitch affiliate program that's brand yeah. new. Woo! Twitch affiliates! So, so thank you, Twitch, and thank you guys for hanging out. Absolutely. Because, I mean, you guys watching us and, and hanging out and asking us wonderful questions is like that's why we were invited so mm -hmm. cool. so, yeah. so thank you guys so much and thank you to host beats again yeah awesome um thank you so awesome. yeah that was a lovely lovely discussion that mm -hmm. went into lizards and yeah and <laughs> we're gonna go all over the melvin place. Yeah. is getting yeah. very talk about uh, all philosophizing things. for us and mm -hmm. is all lizards are reptiles. Socrates is a reptile, but therefore reptiles lizards are, are mortal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very sound. Sound logic. Sound. Yeah. Sound logic. <laughs> I feel like that actually is a really cool thing um, to bring up actually this like separation of like logical following versus scientific following. Because mm -hmm. I feel like people like to conflate like logic and science as being the same thing. Good point. But there's lots of things that you can prove logically that are not true scientifically. And I think that that's a, a really cool thing. Cause like, yeah. um, like if this, then this, then obviously it's true. And it's kind of differentiating the way that the Greeks thought about science, which was basically like whoever could argue like fastest and loudest and had the soundest logic according to the Greeks was right. truth. But the way that we test science is really different actually. Right. As much as we might reference their concepts, we're not really, we don't practice Greek science. Cause you know. And we're, yeah. we're using, you use logic to come up with things like your hypotheses mm -hmm. and the way that you will test yep. that hypothesis and things like that, but the, the logical connection of thoughts is not the be all end all in science. Yeah, anymore. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, plausible doesn't mean probable. Yep, yes. exactly. Yes. Plausibility versus probability. Yes.
Testable. Testable. That's, That's the right. That is, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. that is our word for this program. Right. Or mm -hmm. falsifiable. Or that falsifiable, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Both, Both yeah. of those are awesome. Um, I think actually what you brought up, Lee, about this, um, the whole idea that we're like we're all reptiles um, hits on a really cool thing. I guess we'll probably talk about it tomorrow on um, the evolution episode, but like how we think about evolution, it's much more kind of like cladal or like spectrum-like yeah. mm -hmm. than inclusive. these, it's inclusive yeah. Yeah. rather than these like sharp divides. Yeah. Right. And I think that um, sometimes when we learn about evolution, um, you know, wherever it comes up, we think about these like really sharp divides by things mm -hmm. and it's really more like a progression from one yeah. to the other to the mm -hmm. other to the right. other. Yeah. And then sometimes thinking about that in time can be really complicated yeah. Yeah. actually. And it's awesome, but at the exact same time, it can be a really hard thing to, to wrap your mind oh, around sure. when you're just saying like evolution. Yeah. You, yes. look, you, yeah. you look at an artist, right? Like mm -hmm. let's say Kendrick Lamar, and you only measure him by his hit albums or the what you happen to hear <laughs> on the radio or whatever. Then you get the impression of, oh man, everything this guy does is amazing. You don't hear all the bad songs, mm -hmm. all the yeah. demo tapes, yeah. all the yeah. years of practicing, yeah. Yeah. all the second Yeah, tapes. we don't hear the failures. Exactly. Yeah. We don't mm -hmm. hear the failures. Yeah. 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 Also, I feel like picking Kendrick Lamar when we were just talking about Lamarck is a really great, like, verbal mm, yeah. sort of cue thing. He's You've true. got some, some like, <laughs> Kendrick Lamarckian, yeah. like. Yeah. Kendrick Lamarck. That's great. Oh, I love that. That could turn into something that really could cool. Be, oh, that yeah. could be that really pocket. awesome, actually. <laughs> yeah. Again, Kendrick Lamar, call me. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get phone calls from a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Here's open. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, that was Let's Pronounce Some Shit. You guys yeah. did a great job on those. <laughs> we pronounced the things. Surprisingly, because some of those are really crazy. And there were so yeah. many in this article that we oh, read. Oh, man. Yeah. It was really crazy. I feel um, like that article was a great examination of really great plain speech and, like, so much jargon that I was really like, I don't yeah. even know yes. what, what is, like, I, I was reading it and I was, like, Googling the animals and I'm like, yeah. oh, you mean a sand mole. Right? <laughs> Why didn't yeah. you just say sand mole. Oh, yeah. Instead of the, yeah. the genus and species. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, like it's important for science stuff, but it was also kind of like if you had said sand mole, I right. would have had a picture of what In that is. Yeah. Or yeah. Something. Sand mole. Yeah. Like, yeah. But that's actually a great segue because we're gonna move into our main discussion tonight. So so that is the main event. Excellent. Um, and our main event for tonight is this article um, that we read, and I'll put up a little image of it above Marion here. Um, and it is a paper, it's a little bit older. Um, it's from 2004 by Robertson and colleagues. But it's still so good. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's so simple, but so amazing. It's, and Wonderful. it's a great, it, it really tells a great story. Yes. Which yeah. I really exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, it it's called Survival yeah. in the First Hours of the Cenozoic. Um, and so this is where we're talking about mass extinctions and, and all kinds of things. And that means that I'm going to change up the background <laughs> image, AKA we are going to- Are we in a horrible wasteland? We are going to move. We're not gonna be in the primordial earth anymore. Oh no. Are we in the Cenozoic? Is we're that gonna be in, in the space. first hours. <laughs> oh, we're in space. We're in space. Oh, no. oh. And we are watching asteroids and our meteors come at the primordial earth oh, now. Oh no. no. Earth. So. Oh man. That, that's another thing too, is Earth itself was formed by meteors hitting over long periods of time. Mm, good There's point. been a very narrow sliver of time when animals were very sensitive to those <laughs> meteors coming at them. So we're like asteroids the original pickup artists. They just kept hitting on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the yeah. general idea yeah, that's of the paper. There was like Earth was like the cute girl in OK Cupid, and every asteroid yeah, every was, asteroid was like, box. hey. And over billions and billions of frustrating years, we had enough to kickstart the tectonics. Yes. Are asteroids the ancient dick pic? Oh. <laughs> Basically. Oh my There's god. But and so there was finally the one that was like, yes. Each, <laughs> and each each pick, not convincing. But as a whole, over billions of years, you were, billions you of You were times, just worn down, so it just, wasn't it's <laughs> overwhelming, yeah. I don't like where this analogy is going, I'm calling it quits. Were you were you worn <laughs> down or built up? Like not the answer, yeah, but I feel like the dentist <laughs> needs to yell. It's equally as depressing as the amount of dick pics that most women get on a it's daily basis. True. So there you go. All the of it earth, awful. The earth just really understands us yeah, on like yeah. an emotional level. It's sort of like, I guess another analogy is if every asteroid 
is a picture of Earth was forced to swipe right every time. <laughs> that's that's what it comes down to. Again, dark. <laughs> dark. But not like black hole dark, just yeah. like just, just like dark and just dark, dark emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So we have a really good before we actually get started on the yeah. article, we have a really good point from Falrick. Mm -hmm. um, scholarly publications should strive to be intellectually accessible to as many people as possible without mm -hmm. losing their point. It's annoying yeah. when field jargon is used without need. Mm -hmm. I yes. totally agree with this. Um, yes. Yeah. I honestly think this is probably one of the worst problems yeah. with science because yeah. mm -hmm. science writing and like popular science mm -hmm. writing is mm -hmm. not very good. No. Yeah. And, and you have to pay for it. Right? Yeah. I mean, and yeah, like, you have to all you have to, yeah. you have to yeah. like pay you have to, to not understand it. Right. right. You either trust a pop sci writer to write it correctly and yeah. actually Which have some it do in, well yeah. and many do not. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. you yeah. end up with mm -hmm. with you know something that is totally incomprehensible. Yeah. So, no. so there we was, should do a better job at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I also classy bathrobe said that our asteroids the ancient dick pic is the is an Amazing headline, and I tend to agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's legit. There was, um, I would read that BuzzFeed article. I would absolutely yeah. read that BuzzFeed article. <laughs> that is, oh, uh, yeah. Read that like eight times. And you would be uh, the beast. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Clickbait. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, anyway. so there was, um, I heard about the session at the AAPAs, which yes, is a that's big what I physical, just wanted to talk about. physical anthropologist conference yes. that occurred last weekend. So we, were just why. There, we were just there in New Orleans this past weekend, and there was this incredible conference, or incredible presentation at the conference and it actually closed out the conference this was like the oh, last okay, awesome. the I just last saw like one, one slide it was, from it it was called um oh shoot now I'm blanking uh, on I'm it bringing, I'm, I'm bringing it up right now it was the upgoer challenge and upgoer yep. is from the XKCD comic which decided that what they were going to do is explain the um the Saturn launch uh the launch that went around Saturn and took all these pictures it, using only the thousand most common words in the English language Turns out thousand isn't one of them, so they had to describe it as the ten hundred most common word <laughs> in the English language. <laughs> um, so they called it the Upgoer Five because it was the Saturn Five launch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the challenge was at the AAPAs, which is the American Association of Physical Anthropology, this was the Physanth edition of the Upgoer Five challenge. Um, and the idea was that you have to describe your research using only the ten hundred most common words in the English language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was the most amazing session. Other than the incredible diversity session that also happened at this recent AAPAs, which was also just amazing people talking about really difficult <coughs> to struggle with concepts in academia and in life in general, this one also was like, people really put 1000% so, so, into so, it. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was wonderful. So some, uh, some, some scientific talks given at this yes, session. Yes, there it is. <laughs> Are jumping tree animals getting smaller over time because humans catch and eat the larger ones? <laughs> the, the answer was yes. <laughs> How much food do animals need to walk, run, and climb this much? And there was a computer picture that mm -hmm. showed how much. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> Graph is not one of the words you could say, but computer picture mm -hmm. was. I think oh. um, the one that I saw when I was perusing through Twitter was like, people buried nicely with nice things. People not buried nicely with not nice things. Were people <laughs> and it was they from different hashtag places? Hashtag archaeology. Hashtag archaeology. <laughs> and it was just it was a great it was just a great thing to see, um, yes. which is one of the great things about science Twitter in general. Was I just got this slide and I was like, wait a second, we should think about this in general. Yeah. Actually, totally. this shouldn't be just mm -hmm. like a special thing well, that so, we do right. at the end. So we I'm should, I am a I am a I am a biological anthropologist. I study paleoanthropology specifically. So I'm interested in fossil hominids. I'm interested in these isotope things specifically, these little chemical measurement things. And so there's a lot that happens at the AAPA conference that is well out of anything that I know about um, and that I often have a hard time following when I go to the talks. Even as someone who falls into this relatively mm -hmm. specific realm of science, I still have a hard time following Yeah, it. you can't be a specialist in you every specialist aspect in everything, right? of I your discipline. I don't know about every bump on every bone. I don't know about every I single non-human <laughs> primate. Right, right. <laughs> we all have these different things. But Kate we, is a different specialist. That's my science. Exactly. <laughs> so going to this presentation was like this incredible breath of fresh air where there were people talking about bumps on every bone and every type of monkey that's out there and like all of these other things that I struggle to understand when I listen to the highly technical talk. And I could follow everything they were talking about, even when they sounded really silly talking about it. 
Um, so it was awesome. It was a really, really great session. Yeah. And it addressed that exact issue of like, what the fuck are we doing with all this jargon? Mm -hmm. um, and exactly. and yeah. how, can, how can we actually explain our science mm -hmm. without using it? And it turns out we can do it really well. And mm -hmm. we can do it really accurately. We just have to decide that that's our priority. Yeah, I think that like that brings up the idea of um, who is science actually talking to? Yes, and exactly. like how are we talking to those people? And um, it's one of those things where like there's no reason um, that we really have to use jargon, mm -hmm. um, but it's like when we end up talking to ourselves or when we're in a round table where all of us have PhDs in a particular topic, it's so easy to just like drop all of these, yeah. you know. 10 syllable words that mean this very specific right. thing, but at the exact same yeah. time, the whole point that we're really doing science, besides the fact that we think is cool, it's cool, is the idea that everybody else thinks it's cool yeah. and that like everybody else can to a certain degree benefit from it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we're here today to talk about the big thing that hit the even bigger thing that caused all the animals to die. <laughs> Hold your horses, Lee. Okay. It's refill time, and I'm just Woo! going to get in front of yeah. the camera again. I want to awkwardly to talk into their boobs. Uh, <laughs> because I'm going to open this with my lovely Twitch bottle opener that Woo! I got from TwitchCon last year. Woo! Promoting Let's Twitch. See. Let's see if I can do this without yeah. being awkward. That's okay. Uh, I'm notoriously bad at <laughs> winning. All right. Thank you. you. Refill? Thank you. Yes. Refill? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. I'm really upset that this Ghost Rider white IPA doesn't have Ghost Rider actually on it. And it's oh, a, right. like a, a mm. ghost person riding a horse and not like a really cool dude and like a fiery low rider. <laughs> or Nicolas Cage. <laughs> or Nicolas. Oh, ah, not Nicolas Cage. That's, that's probably a copyright issue. That's probably, yeah, it's probably yeah. a copyright yeah, so But like, it's the, very sad. Yeah. It's like Robbie Ray is forever. Um, <laughs> But Yay. the whole idea of a white IPA is really appealing, Thank actually. Ooh, is it with delicious? coriander. It is kind of delicious. It's got coriander in it. Ooh, also, I, like I did not realize that like coriander and cilantro were the same thing. Just one's talking about like the leaves and one's talking about the seeds. I did not know that. That's pretty awesome. Like I'm pre I, like unless I'm totally wrong and someone's gonna call no, me out in the live tweets, but like true. coriander and cilantro can, are the same. Can we same. get a Wikipedia check? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <that's okay. laughs> anyone, anyone? You're the one with the phone. I will verify this. this okay. Is I'm pretty actually, sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm like true. pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a weird thing that like I learned when I was living in Australia. They're like probably. Okay, so yes, so so let's start Ooh, nice. in on the actual paper, the first survival in the first hours of the Cenozoic. Or, um, or I want you to say your your hot tub time the machine. I'm the big thing. <laughs> hit another big thing. And most of the guys died. <laughs> yes, but not the ladies. Go. Most of the animals died. Okay, yes. said it's the first okay. Time. I like That's that. True. There you then go. You push the button right there. <laughs> oh, button. No, you just have to make his legs go. Oh, yeah. there you go. The, the button's actually better, but yeah, that's Planosaurus. Most <laughs> of the animals There's died. The generic, the generic is not the male. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but speaking of that, though, do you want to actually summarize the article for us? Yeah. 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 So, well, first off, let me just say that this is a terrifying article when you actually really think about its implications. Yeah. yeah. And it uses lots of pure <laughs> physics. So, like, mm -hmm. one of the things that I often criticize paleontology for, and one mm -hmm. of the reasons I left paleontology, is to me, paleontology is the science of, hey, I found this thing. And I, it's kind of trophy hunting, right? Uh, but this <laughs> article transcends that and uses physics to really get at just... And so you left paleontology for that reason and then went to archaeology? <laughs> Light step up, you can't jump way up. up. I like to dig up things. Like that's that's my favorite. That's that my it, favorite. That was it's, a joke. I'm just giving you shit. Yeah. It's but it's climate archaeology. Yeah. It's a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, there are no climate trophies. <laughs> not yet. If it exists at all, you know. No. So not it's anymore. True. Definitely. Sorry, yeah. So, so yeah. So what? Yeah. What's the big impetus well, for, for yeah, all of this? Like, first, what's the big thing? Let's first start by about? you know the fact that we don't have that many birds with teeth anymore. I like to think of dinosaurs as birds with teeth. Mm -hmm. The reason most of those guys are gone has basically was the mystery for most of the 20th century. People said, "Hey, here are dinosaurs." And then the next question is, is where did they go? What <laughs> happened to those dinosaurs? Because the idea that a whole group of animals could go extinct is really weird. What would cause all of them to go extinct at around the same time? Mm -hmm. The best evidence for that came from oil exploration in the Yucatan, in the, in the, Gulf, of, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So you guys remember the BP oil horizon thing? They're basically looking for viable places to find lots of oil. So, and actually this is how a lot of great geology happens. Oil companies pay for the digging of one of these wells, mm -hmm. which costs millions and millions of dollars. And in the process of getting up with data, they find weird stuff. The weird stuff they found was lots of hot, compacted rock in an area right off the Yucatan Peninsula, which is where the Maya were uh, in today's Mexico. Mm -hmm. 
and they uh, they name the area uh, and pronunciation. Chichalub? 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 Is that Chichalub? it? Chichalub. Yeah, yeah Chichalub. Right? Yeah. Chichalub. Chichalub. Yeah. So Not in, my pronunciation. Uh, in Chichalub. It's a giant It's a giant caldera. Part of it's on land. Part of it's underwater. What's a caldera? It's, we have a map. Yeah, caldera. It's above your head. Is a basically, if an, asteroid, the thing. if an asteroid hits the that earth, works. a caldera <laughs> is the big circle thing. So it's a crater. Behind. A crater, exactly. Yes. Yeah. I feel like caldera is a very like New Mexican term for the thing there. that everybody else that calls is we'll crater. Call crater is fine. Crater is fine. <laughs> this particular crater, if I remember correctly, and I'll need this is one of those things where you read about this stuff and you forget the exact numbers. Yeah. I think about, <laughs> everything I read, Lee, yeah. I, yeah, right. I read this and I'm like, yeah. what are numbers? I think it's about 200 kilometers wide. The, the crater itself. Mm -hmm. At least the, the inner crater is about 200 kilometers wide, about 160 miles. The NASA JPL map that they made does not have a scale. What? Oh! Party what foul. Shame. If you are making maps, you need to include a scale, yep. a north arrow, and a title. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Please, if I you are concur. making maps, please but do I know, this thing. So the asteroid That's all you need is five kilometers. They estimate five <coughs> kilometers long. I don't know what that no. translates into. Long, bigger, long or diameter? It's diameter. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair. Um, and I don't know what that translates into as far as the yeah. the caldera crater well, would so, be. Yeah, the caldera is about 200 Much kilometers. Much bigger. The, the asteroid itself, I think, was about 10 kilometers long, but then it was narrow. It wasn't a perfect orb. Melvin Mills so it was a very good point that calderas are volcanic. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Would be you. the right word. You ah! Know, ah! Right, you win this Bam! Thank you, you win this Bam! I am so used to saying the word. <laughs> no, it's a, no, yeah, it's a, I feel, no, they're, yeah. they're like very New Mexican. Yeah, yeah no. There are so yeah. many folks. Yeah. Like, yeah. Anyway. yeah, we've anyway. been here for so, so long that, yeah. like, if there's a Spanish version of, like, a noun that we can say, it's bosque, it's rio, it's not river, it's not forest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's bosque, rivo, it's caldera, it's not crater, river, forest. Language differences. Yeah. Regionalism. Important, actual, specific scientific Yeah, yeah, legit. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. And so just to get a sense of what this would have been like, imagine the area between Philadelphia and New York was lava. Like one second ago it was fine, now it's lava. Mm -hmm. That's that's the scale of devastation. It's we're like you're about. in elementary school and suddenly yes. all the bark underneath yeah. you is lava and you're just like, I can't deal yeah. with this. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, or like you play it in your living room on couch cushions. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, this fun. one went from Navigable Where? to not navigable. Yeah. So, okay. to... so let's say you're in a plane. You're flying from Brazil to Texas, you know, mm -hmm. Houston, United. Uh, they didn't, they <laughs> didn't kick you off the flight. They, uh, but as you're flying, you look to your right and you see the meteor coming into Earth. It would have been coming in so it's fast. It's happening behind you. It's happening behind me. <laughs> yeah. It would have been coming. I hope, I hope the image displays this. It would have been coming in so fast, it would have compressed the atmosphere <laughs> underneath. Mm -hmm. So it would have looked like a black finger touching into the Earth. Because you don't have the Rayleigh scattering in the sky as that Earth is compressed uh -huh. if you're looking at it from the side. And when this black finger touches the ground, because again, the air isn't getting out of the way, it's just being compressed. Mm -hmm. Any animals or life would have just been pancakes by the air pressure mm -hmm. a second before the ground turned to lava. Mm -hmm. And then this thing just pummeled in. Now, after it pummels in, Newton's is a third law. Uh, for every for every force, there's an equal but opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. Yes. We need, we need a Wikipedia. Is that is that the right law? No, wait. Third law is inertia, which is no. our channel. Which is your channel. Yeah. <laughs> second law. What, second, what? Law, was second, second law. Second law. Second, second law. Second law. Second. Second law. All right. Yes. We're gonna go with that. Please Wait. comment her. Yeah. <laughs> when you read those laws and the way that Newton actually formulated them, I'm just like, how did we get to this mean, meaning this actually? Because yeah. right. like, I, I, I think I read a couple of them when I was first like looking at physics stuff, and I was just like. Yeah. Wait, is it, what? What are you talking about, Newton? Wait, I want to keep, I want to keep hearing Sorry, about yes. animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to theory. Pancakes. Yeah, animals crushed. <laughs> and then there's, there's basically, so first off, there's three big effects that happen immediately. Mm -hmm. The first one is all the animals are crushed. And all the animals are crushed. a lake of lava is created. The second one is the tidal wave <laughs> that would have emerged from this. Because you would have had a tidal wave something on the order of 30 meters high as it came into North America. I've actually okay, seen... Ready? Lake of lava. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Lava lake? Sorry. Lake of lava? Wait, hang what? on. What? Yeah. Okay. We're about lake to get of a lava. Lake of lava! Okay. <laughs> so the tidal wave, as it hits. I accidentally put Sue up. We'll oh, yeah. bring her out later. <laughs> the tidal wave, as it hits North America, just crushed up the continental crust. You've had mm -hmm. water just soaring across. So any animals living on the coast of North America would have been would have drowned probably as far north as Tennessee. I'm just imagining like, like we're a, talking a, crazy a deer with a thought yeah. bubble being like a oh, fuck. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
Damn it! Oh no! <laughs> Not Paulina, today. You, you have a, a spire of, of lava coming out of your head. Really <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Fuck! I just noticed. <laughs> so, when this when, when you've got this lake of lava, mm -hmm. the force of this thing coming in pushes this molten slurry of silica and aluminum out, and it's got to be about equal to the force that's brought in. Mm -hmm. And what's great about this article is what Robertson and colleagues do is they calculate the physics of what mm -hmm. happens next. Now, mm -hmm. when I was growing up, when we learned about how dinosaurs died, it was sort of like a nuclear winter. Like, it kicked up so much sand and dust that it clouded the sun, and the plants all died, and things starved to death. Robertson and his colleagues point out that it would have been far, far, far more dramatic mm -hmm. because the dust wouldn't have stayed in the air. First mm -hmm. off, it wouldn't have been dust. It would have been glass. Mm -hmm. So you've got all this ejecta coming up, mm -hmm. and it hits the upper mm -hmm. circulation patterns of the atmosphere. Yeah. It's, and it's glass because it was superheated, right? It's, it's these, a, these well, sand particles exactly. that get superheated and turn into glass. So for example, like when lightning strikes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, they, the beach, yeah. you get Here's tiny the little pieces they of glass. Been, they might not have been glass when they hit the upper atmosphere, though. They might have mm -hmm. still been a mixture of lava, glass beads, mm -hmm. and so they're splitting out into these small little splinters. It's like mm -hmm. literally, if you think about what we literally portray the apocalypse as, like this. This is what we're talking about. Oh, like, yeah. like if anyone wants to make an argument for like genetic memory of like what <laughs> hell and the apocalypse were like, I feel like this is yeah. a great example of genetic memory. But, so exactly. you make a really good point. So all this, all this stuff ends up ejected up into the atmosphere in this one place, right by yeah. the Yucatan. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. yeah. So it's like, but then it hits these air currents, mm -hmm. and it hits these air currents that carry it very far away mm -hmm. from the Yucatan Peninsula. Mm -hmm. yep. And eventually, it's not up in the air anymore, and it comes raining down, and mm -hmm. this is like literal this is fire and terrible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It yeah. is it is hell. It is the apocalypse. Everyone's like fuck. Like yeah. what am I doing here anymore? Exactly. Like, and, th and that's the thing. Like you can get like so for example, if you jump to this atmospheric circulation, mm -hmm. you could get from Albuquerque to Shanghai in about 2 hours. Which is mm -hmm. what these super fast jets are trying to do is get up high enough that you hit these air currents so you can jump across the world very very quickly. Mm -hmm. This is what this ejecta did. Exactly. Exactly. And as it comes down, it comes down all around the same time. Mm -hmm. So you have all these glass beads coming down. And what happens when something mm -hmm. falls out of the atmosphere? To it? What happens to its temperature? It, it raises increases. and it gets hotter. Mm -hmm. What happens mm -hmm. when you have trillions and trillions of glass beads falling at the exact same time <laughs> all around the world? Lots of artisans being really upset no, about what's happening. They paid for this yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It got incredibly hot. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that's what the, what the authors call the infrared pulse, which yep. is a fancy way of saying it got really, 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 really hot. Really hot shit yep. fell down yep. from the air. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't quite on fire, but it was really damn hot. It might as well have been. What was, yeah. what was this in Celsius? Can anyone remember? I think no. they only talked, they were only reporting the stuff Kelvin. in Kelvin. In it was Kelvin? like 10, 10 or 30 so degrees Kelvin, Kelvin stuff. Kelvin is yet another way to measure temperature, not yeah. in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Mm -hmm. and it's the way to measure temperature in space. Yep, it is exactly. the way to measure temperature in space because it is much more attuned to incredibly mm -hmm. extreme temperatures in yeah. one direction. And Kelvin is actually based on, so the idea of zero, so temperature is actually um, particles moving. Yeah, right. That's right. actually that's it's actually energy. what temperature. Yeah, it's energy. It's yes. energy. So it's actually particles moving, and so zero degrees Kelvin is actually when everything stops. Zero. Stops. Energy. Zero. No yeah. movement. Yes. Um, which is crazy to imagine. But, yeah. And so they, when you I measure, I recently saw a thing that said that they could prove that it cannot go any lower than this. Mm. It was always like mm. a theoretical yeah. minimum. Yeah. Yeah. But no, they I, just proved somehow that that's actually that it, the minimum. Yeah. If it would ever get there, this is what it yeah. would be. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll talk yeah. about that sometime on a physics episode. That would be yeah. fun. And, and, no. to, and to convert yeah. Kelvin to Celsius though, it's only like it's like plus it's right? um plus I think it's subtract two seventy three. Is it two seventy three? Subtract two seventy three from Celsius, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, so. I think right? so. I will check that. I'm going completely um, from memory on this. We've got, we've got yeah. some Googling yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. Other people are Googling. Mm -hmm. But no, it's it's um it's an interesting thing to kind of think about that in relation to like absolute absolute zero yes. and kind of measuring yes. it so, in that so way. Zero um, Celsius is 273 degrees Kelvin. Great, awesome. great. So we got to subtract. So the I'm bringing up the paper right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the the temperature specifically was. It was really hot. About like a thousand was, Kelvin. So we're no. looking at what's one thousand minus two seventy three? Eight hundred and something something. Mm -hmm. something. Yes. No, seven hundred and seven hundred and twenty seven. So seven hundred and thirty degrees Celsius. Celsius. Next Celsius. next question. Most people don't think in Celsius. Most no. people think in Fahrenheit. But the thing is that what at, at seven hundred degrees, everybody's like, that's too hot for me because forty. So forty degrees yeah. Celsius is roughly like a hundred degrees ish. Seven thirty Fahrenheit. So we're talking about like four hundred to two hundred right. times. 
20 times that. So that's going to be 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, Frosty Betrayer. I see you yes. out there. And yes, <laughs> yeah. those negative things with Kelvin get super weird. Thankfully, we are on the other end of Kelvin. <laughs> we have nowhere near anything negative. So we don't have to worry about that. I always yeah. imagine like, conversation. the idea of negative Kelvin being like going back in time. Yeah. Like reversing your movement and that oh, just like blows my brain and it's like yes, it's awesome. <laughs> like yeah, negative Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Um but the yeah. lava behind your head right now is your <laughs> mind being it's yeah, literally it's really literally perfect. yeah, and yeah. it's so much hotter than I can think imagine it being. Um but yeah, no, so, it's so we have yeah. this this depiction that is <laughs> what seems to be literal Armageddon, mm -hmm. where you've got mm -hmm. fire and brimstone and the world burning and all of mm -hmm. these other things, and yet we know that about 25% of species managed to survive like, this. Yeah. yeah, some people and were this, like, that's really hot, but I can but deal. But I'm cool. And yeah, so but I'm cool. cool. <laughs> 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 so the coolest thing, I'm not going to give the punchline away because I'm going to let one of you two do it. The coolest thing about this paper is that not only do they depict exactly how absurd and horrifying this event would have been. But they say, all right, if we know that this event was so cataclysmic, but we know that about 25% of species that were alive then managed to survive past this event and then sort of propagate and speciate and turn yeah. into all the species that we see on the earth today, how in the world did they do it? Mm -hmm. And so this sort of idea that's always been out there is like, all right, if I could be like, way underground or if I lived like way deep down in the ocean maybe I was insulated from this mm -hmm. and what these guys did was say all right what about the physics of this actual like infrared burst mm -hmm. and the amount of energy that would have been released how far is way deep down in the earth how mm -hmm. far is way deep down in the ocean mm -hmm. how far would I have had to been or how, where would I have had to been in order to be insulated from this literal apocalypse mm -hmm. and, and we're think... talking about the apocalypse like think about 1300 degrees Fahrenheit in earth for a second What's happening in the oceans when this is going mm -hmm. on? Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I think question. I think like the cool thing about this article too is that they stressed kind of um, to a certain degree how quickly this happened too. Yeah, because yes. it's not like oh, it was a thousand degrees for a thousand years. What was it the was title? like <laughs> so I don't even remember. survival in the first hours of yeah. the sun is so, over. So yes. it's like we're thinking about this like extreme temperature, but it's like it's on this really, really fine right. time scale. Right. Yes. And so it's yeah. not just like, oh yeah, it got hot, it stayed hot for forever. It's more like, can can you last this one hour in the kitchen? Yeah. Right. Exactly. And and, exactly. and like thinking about that in that crazy time where it's like this really extreme environment, but it only was around for an hour. Right. And like this ad right. idea that one hour of time completely changed the trajectory right. of what happened was on the planet. Was the bottleneck yeah. that you like, had to get through? Like this that's one crazy. important. <laughs> it's like a crisis hour. Like right. that's what right. happened. What did you do in this hour determines not only the history of you, <laughs> not only the history of your children or whatever, but also the history of your species like, and all the species life that come yeah. thereafter. At all. Yes. On this planet. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. And so let, let's play this out, right? I am a marine reptile, a mosasaur, and I uh, and I am deep in the ocean. <laughs> How do I survive this? I'm a mosasaur. I'm like big old, big old marine reptile mm -hmm. swimming under the water. Yeah. Could I make it? Yeah. Well, so well, that's the question. Did they? Yeah, did, well, did they? Did they? No. No. Oh, they all they died. did not. I've, this has always bugged me forever. Why did the marine reptiles die? <sighs> well, why would they have died? But what do they have to do? To, to survive, what is the number one thing that you have to do in order to survive? Breathe. They have to breathe. So mm -hmm. they have to come up. And if the water is boiling lovely, on the surface... That was a lovely collective breath. Yeah. <laughs> so, once more really with nice. feeling. So the marine reptiles <laughs> never had a fighting chance because they had to come up for, for a breath. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they're gone. Where do, but where, that's, a, that's where, actually an interesting yeah. contrast, though, because they talk about, like, for example, like we were talking about this before. Right, this but we haven't gotten to the dramatic reveal of yeah, how... Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. you have to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's another thing about marine reptiles that they have to do that they might have been worse so, at so, doing than other so, individuals. Tell, yeah, tell us about some well, marine reptiles, Lee. Well, so first off, the, 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 we're talking about the boiling of the surface of the oceans, right? So we know the mosasaurs have to come up for breath. So it's very easy to see how a lot of them will have oh. died very quickly. But going one step further, where is most of the life in the oceans located? Super deep down. No, no. very I close like, to ah, the, ah, In very shallow oceans, yeah. very, very close to the surface. I'm an archaeologist. I don't know anything about the oceans. <laughs> I just <laughs> swim and <laughs> <them> enjoy them. <laughs> so I, I know what Noah is, but I don't like yeah, Noah. Right. So that. the question that we have to answer that this paper answers that I'm trying to get us to this thing about, because this is what will launch us into the rest yeah, of the yeah, yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
how how far if I am if I'm a burrowing little mammal, how far down do I have to go? If I am an animal in the ocean, how far under the water do I have to be? And if you ask people this, you sort of like, oh well, maybe like I don't know, like a thousand meters. Like, how far down do I actually have to go? And the answer is on the earth in the soil, you have to go ten inches. That's how far down you have to go in order to avoid that pulse of incredibly hot, hot mm -hmm. infrared radiation. I think and if you can survive under the soil for not 10 inches, 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters 10 in like centimeters. Wow. an hour in 10 centimeters. If you can survive under 10 centimeters of soil for an hour plus, you're good. Yeah. And so our ancestors, everybody watching and us sitting up here, were these tiny little mole-like rat things that definitely burrowed and were probably asleep in their dens and didn't even know what was happening until long after the fact. <laughs> they like came up and were like, where's my good leaf patch? Right, we, <laughs> like, why is it on fire? Where is my home? <laughs> Which brings us to the I'm mosasaurs and all of the other things on the, in the ocean and the point of like how far down in the water do you have to be? And it's, it's about the same, it might be slightly less. But it's about 10 centimeters as well. But it doesn't matter because, well, so first off, where, where are all, where's all the life in the oceans located? We're the most, the majority of it. Shallow seas. Shallow seas. And what type of life is it? Like, what is it? Is it fish? Is it, what, what, what do we call those guys? Plankton. Plankton. So yeah. the plankton would have been extremely vulnerable to this thousand degree Fahrenheit flash of heat in the, the boil point. Mm -hmm. And one of the most interesting things about this is the best way to track these mass extinctions aren't the charismatic dinosaurs, the triceratops, the T-Rexes. It's the little guys. Because for the little guys to go extinct, something massive has mm -hmm. to happen. Sorry, I was just thinking so, about super suave Tyrannosaurus yeah. rexes, and I was like... <laughs> they are... They they're are, very charismatic. It's like, you can you pick up the all charisma? the ladies. Yeah. Do you feel the charisma? Short arms, great charisma. Yeah. So, but in any case, I think something like 54% of diatoms go extinct. What are diatoms? Mm -hmm. They're super small, very small photosynthetic plankton that live in surface waters of the ocean. Mm -hmm. They're I'm floating like, right on the yeah. surface of the water. Mm -hmm. And to have that many of them, like that's a key part of the food system, right? Mm -hmm. So any mosasaurs that could hold their breath for that hour, they couldn't make it because their food supply, the, the, the exactly. keystone species of the oceans mm -hmm. has gone out in an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took a long time for these guys to repopulate. Right. So that's one of the reasons why for these great extinction events, the marine systems are such a key indicator for how bad mm -hmm. of an event they were. Mm -hmm. The land systems, it's actually probably easier to survive on land than in the sea. Because mm -hmm. in theory, yeah, sure, like Pluridog can go way mm -hmm. deep down into the ocean. But, but the, you can't find anything. You have to eat something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. no, I think the land thing was really interesting because um, I don't know if we're necessarily actually at the main event yet. Um, but this idea that like if you were in a rock shelter, you were fine. Yeah. yeah. And so it was yeah, this yeah. really weird mm -hmm. thing where it was like it wasn't this idea of like your atmosphere filtering in through your rock shelter. It was literally like in that hour where the like fire and brimstone was raining down on you. If you were under the rain, you were fucked. But if you weren't under the rain, you were fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cause like kind of crazy thing to think about this. Like it, w it was like a temperature increase, but it wasn't necessarily a temperature increase that immediately like flooded every cave system that existed. Right. And to be clear, so when you came out of this cave, right, you yep. would find a massively depleted food set of resources. <laughs> Everything was on fire. <laughs> Everything was on fire. <laughs> so there would still be a lot of sort of survival challenges thereafter, yeah, yeah, yeah. but only, it, it's like necessary but not sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. You absolutely had to be one of these species that could burrow or could be way under the water, but that be. didn't guarantee that you were going to be able to survive because you also then had to be able to find all of the food that you needed. Mm -hmm. So even though the Mosasaur was way under there, mm -hmm. the Mosasaur couldn't, because this food, his food chain was destroyed, so the mm -hmm. Mosasaur couldn't find food yeah. afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was necessary to be under some sort of sheltering amount of water or soil, but not sufficient. You then mm -hmm. still had to be able to be a generalist enough Yes. individual to find the food to find the things you needed to survive right. after that yeah i think also with the example of like the mosasaurus or whatever that looks mm -hmm. like um is this idea of like the time it elapsed before something went extinct because i think there were obviously probably lots of species that like immediately like it got hot they burned up they died sorry guys mm -hmm. but then then there are these ones that kind of Most had this of slow guys. progression <laughs> where they weren't able to 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 um continue to reproduce or whatever because their food, yeah. food source was Absolutely. eliminated and so like yeah there were probably tons of like reptilian species that went away but it might have been like at, at a slower pace yeah um but kind of thinking about that in that sense that you have this hour-long event 
it affects lots of people really immediately, but then it affects kind of other people slowly, unfortunately. By people, you mean? By people, by people. <laughs> By people, I mean archaic <laughs> versions of the animals that currently exist. Yeah. So, like <laughs> desert rats. Yeah. So we have a, a, a lingering question from from Hosey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't crocodiles and turtles survive this as well? Yes, they did. They did. How they did. did they do this if they have to come up for air? So they can survive for many hours without breathing. Um, cool. For one thing. Um, for another thing, so there's there's a really cool part of this article that talks about diving birds, and I. <laughs> If I had an alternative life, I would be an ornithologist and I would study birds. <laughs> I adore birds <laughs> and I've chosen a very different path in life, but that's okay. Um, so I really got into this part about birds, but basically it said the reason that some birds species survive, particularly diving birds, is because they can go underwater for about a minute to two at a time, which is not long enough to survive this heat pulse. But they can come up and get a breath fast enough and get back down fast enough that they would have had singeing on their feathers and they would have, but they would not have had damage to the tissue of their actual like breathing tract. They wouldn't have lungs. died. They wouldn't have died. So if they had just come up for a really fast breath and then gone immediately back down, there wouldn't have. They would have been able to survive that. Mm -hmm. um, which, and if they were far enough away, kind of from the initial impact. Right. Oh, obviously, those living on the Yucatan Peninsula were pretty well spread. Yeah, like across all species. <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> if you were a bird living elsewhere, you if you were under under the asteroid, you were right. Fucked. You like apparently those. would have been okay. And that's the same thing holds true for nice catch. <coughs> that was awesome. <laughs> the same thing holds true for crocodiles and turtles, many of whom can go into a torpor in which they breathe once. What is it like once a minute? Or something like that oh, once an know. hour yeah. this the torpor state is incredible where they breathe incredibly <laughs> infrequently and they can do so underneath a whole bunch of mud mm -hmm. certainly more than 10 centimeters of it that would have insulated them from that impact and importantly they're generalists yes mm -hmm. absolutely you know, the survivors mm -hmm. of history mm -hmm. tend to be those that can eat anything mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why yeah. i'm not convinced humans are going to be one of the animals that goes extinct because like turtles like alligators we can turn almost anything into food yeah um, we, but it's all, we're much more expensive though too because these guys don't need that much energy to survive. Mm -hmm. So they can ma they can maintain a torpor state like that. We couldn't, right? right. We're, mm -hmm. we're, our metabolism is burning so hot. Uh, just the fact that you're watching this and thinking about this, that's consuming 20% of the it's energy like, you're yeah. using right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Your just like, a lot. Yeah. we're yeah. a really attractive species. We're super hot. We're like, yeah. this is amazing. So, super hot, super cool. <laughs> we're super hot, super cool. It's amazing. But, but the animals that survived typically had the uh, some combination of these traits. Mm -hmm. They can eat almost yes. anything. Mm -hmm. They have habitats that could be far enough below the infrared range. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to focus here on what Mary was saying earlier, which she says 10 centimeters of sand, what does that mean? Well, think of it this way. How bright would the light have to be outside your house to shine through the walls? There you go. That's a good you know, In physics, there is a physical limit to how deep a photon can move through material. Uh, the color green will not go through white paint. No matter how bright that green light is, it's never going to get through that yep. because it can absorb everything. The same thing happens with silicon dioxide. There's a limit to how much infrared it can absorb at a certain depth. So white paint absorb or reflect? Reflects everything. It reflects. White reflects everything. White, Sorry, white reflects everything. You Sorry, just said absorbing green. I was like, no, there ain't plants. Well, well, so, uh, but I mean, fair, yeah, fair, fair, fair point. Let's say it's fair. black. Let's say it's yeah. black. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. even at that point, even when it's black, there's a limit to how deep that green can go yeah. Yeah. until yeah. the photon's energy is completely dissipated mm -hmm. in the yeah. electron yeah. cloud. And that's what Marion is saying, is that if you're 10 centimeters underground, that is All the that limit. energy that's is dissipated. It, it doesn't yeah. matter how hot it is, just like it doesn't matter how bright it is outside. Right, you're you not going to see it. You can block it with a wall. Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. This, by the way, is why you don't get a sunburn in your car. Because the glass mm -hmm. in your car windows is that infinite thickness for UV. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how much UV is out there, it's the glass is going to block it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right, I have, I have a question, but before yeah. I make this question or ask this question, I would just like to give a shout out to Michael, Michael Ludwig on Twitter, mm -hmm. who is live tweeting this. <laughs> That's and it awesome. is <laughs> glorious. Yay! Thanks, Michael! <laughs> Full disclosure, that's probably Michael, my boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. Awesome. Awesome. Twitter. Yay! But it is wonderful, and I have enjoyed it immensely. Um, so everyone should go follow Michael underscore Ludwig, Michael being M-Y-C-H-A-L. Mm -hmm. um, Old English spelling. Yeah, it's, it's really glorious. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I will put a little... Um, 
thingy. So he's Michael yeah. Me in Twitch chat. He is Michael Me. Yeah. I will put in a, a, an at thing in yeah. in the chat for Twitter. Awesome. Awesome. Excellent. So it's, I, it's I a cannot good, wait good to look time. back at It's this really funny. Time. There's a, he <laughs> took a screenshot of Paulina on one of them with the lava behind her. It's, <laughs> it's really <laughs> solid. I, I really enjoy I can't, it. I can't wait to get home yeah. and just be like, what did I do <laughs> today? It? What it's did really, I do today? It's really, really fantastic. Question. Actually, I feel like this is a good... specific question in the... I can't I'm sorry, there's a T-Rex in the way. It says, what if you blast the photon while vibrating the medium at a very high frequency? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Good question, So. The, what what what's happening is is so, so you've got your atom. Hold so, your hold your hand like this, Paulina. And then Marine, <laughs> can you circle your 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 hand around hers? That's the electron moving around. Basically, the energy hits that electron. Really every time. great sound effects. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, so it doesn't matter how fast it's vibrating. You're still getting the energy nope, from that nope, photon. Or does it hit the electron? The, okay. The light as both um, was a particle and wave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't like that either. So like, there's a story <laughs> that came out of nature. You don't like I, it. I gotta say this. I gotta say this. I, I'm a partisan. I have very strong feelings about <laughs> Wait, the you're, particle you're, wave. Wait, you're 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 a partisan, isn't you're a particle partisan? I'm a particle partisan. You got it. So the but I, I want to all the science ones are strong tonight. There was a, there was a paper you that came Paulina out on. a while uh, back. We knew this was yeah. gonna happen. <laughs> Basically, my, my Twitter handle is punuckish. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, I always called it punkish. <laughs> now you know. Like four of the vowels. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my not first time. <laughs> but in any case, the um, uh, what were we even talking about? <laughs> particle wave duality. Particle wave duality. Think reality. of the part. So think of the, so here's the analogy I like to think of with mm -hmm. particle wave duality in physics. Right? It's I don't think it's as complicated as it seems. Think of it as a particle before it interacts with an electron, and it's a wave after. So okay. if you're an anthropologist and you're studying people, the people are a particle before you hit them with your car. <laughs> but they're a wave after. And you can't that's measure not, That's both not ethically. At the same time. That's really that's not ethical. Nor is it anthropology, but we, we have we got rid of a lot of regulations. The IRB was one of them. You are you're home free. I don't think I can write to NSF and be like, hi, my entire dissertation is me as an anthropologist hitting people. Have you applied to NSF? Oh my God. It's about weight <laughs> theory, so anyway. <laughs> yeah, I just stick my hand out the window and be like, hey guys. We've apparently hit peak drunk based on yeah. our <laughs> chat features. So. I think so. Anyway. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so anyway, I had a question. And Hose Beach points out that I need a refill, yes. which he's clicked oh, on. You so. do need a refill. Actually, okay. speaking of that, can we take a potty break? Yes, potty okay. break. Potty yeah. Okay. We'll do okay. a quick refill, and, and while we're doing that, we're going to take a potty break. We will good be call. right back. Please enjoy the music, and I will mute everyone so you can't hear us. Oh, peace. good. <laughs> Thank you.
from our quick potty break. Please pardon us for our bladders. Um, we have learned that when we feed our panelists a whole bunch of alcohol, we have to pee. So it's science. <laughs> it's necessary. I am this tall, my, batter, my bladder is this big. Yep, that's, that's right. Okay. So yeah, so, so pardon our, our seal breaking. Um, so okay, so we're gonna bring it back into our discussion. Um, in the hours after the Chichalube impact, um, we've got all these things that are dying off. Mm -hmm. um, but my question from before was, what actually happens in the wake of this impact that sort of really changes the, the path of life on mm. Earth? Go uh, ahead. What, can actually, <laughs> what can actually survive this yes. and why does that matter? Yes. In New Mexico, where it's called Caldera. <laughs> Non-volcanically, it's the asteroidal. <laughs> asteroidal. <laughs> asteroidal. <laughs> asteroidal. <laughs> so, up north, and have you guys ever gone I-25 to Colorado on the way to Denver, Raton mm -hmm. Pass? It's this steep drop-off. You're literally like falling off of Colorado into the pit of New Mexico. <laughs> and in we can talk about our steep like, wells. Yeah, like, yeah, look over that cliff like, yeah, if I jump, I'm in New Mexico. I can make it. It's, it's the land of entrapment for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, there's, you, pa you actually drive past the KT boundary on this road in I-25. Mm -hmm. and what is the KT boundary, Lee? The KT boundary is the ash layer from the layer of destruction we just deposited. By the way, quick thing about- We the just deposited? So or are you talking about- Chronologically, so, so the Chicks asteroid live, hit. Yeah. Chicks live impact yeah. and- <laughs> Exactly, the debris flow, the, all the glass that fell out of the mm -hmm. sky. All the and things that the lit way, everything on fire. Yeah. And this, this has a unique signature, which is how we can tell it. Mm -hmm. It has, there's a rare, signature rare, rare metal called iridium. Mm -hmm. Iridium is an element, IR on the periodic table. It is exceptionally rare. It only exists in single digit PPB. Oh, uh, I know it's crust, part per billion, part per billion. So in other oh, words, wow. if I've got a billion molecules, one or two of them might be iridium. And the KT boundary, this, this jumps up to like 200 to 300 parts per billion. Dang. Which doesn't sound like a big deal, but you're by multiplying mm -hmm. by 300, mm -hmm. how yeah. much Exponentially increasing around. how much is happening. And that's happening. the fingerprint, because asteroids have more iridium than Earth's crust does. So this is how if I find a rock and I think this looks very suspicious and I think it might be an asteroid, I could measure iridium. the iridium exactly. in it and see exactly. if it was actually asteroid. That's the idea, mm -hmm. okay. exactly. So this iridium layer demarcates this. And at Raton Pass, we have coal above and below it. And the coal is preserved well enough, it's a type of coal called lignite, where you can actually see the plant structures. I can see what plants they are, their leaves, but most importantly, I can count their stomata. Stomata are the little holes on plants that lead in the carbon dioxide and release the oxygen mm -hmm. back from it. If you count up, now it's, the plant needs CO2, but every time it breathes, out, breathes in CO2, it loses water. So it wants to match stomata to how much CO2 is in the air. Mm -hmm. By counting the stomata, we can see how much CO2 is out there. So for reference point, global warming, which is just a theory. Stop! Hurry up, Red House, it's our theory. We can go over this. If, if, it's just a, if it's just a theory, you're talking about a hypothesis. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah, that we yeah, can yeah. came to this conclusion. Which, right. like, it's a theory, it's pretty damn good. It's just like anyway. gravity. Just a theory. That's for another episode. Yeah, we will return to this idea. Mm -hmm. Please continue with this tonight. But anyway, so global warming is we have uh, a pre-industrial CO2 concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide. We're about, uh, car CO2 to carbon dioxide, we're about 285 parts per million, parts per million. Now, this year, they, had, they hit 410 parts per million for the first time since, in, in, since we've had recorded measurements, really. Mm -hmm. So global warming, the climate change we're worried about, is about 100 parts per million increase. Keep that number in mind. If you count the stomata before the CO2 increase, before the asteroid hits, CO2 is at about 600 to 800 parts per million wow. in the atmosphere. So the Cretaceous, when these guys were living, was a way, way, way hotter environment mm -hmm. than what we can really imagine right now. After the asteroid hit, CO2 was at about 2,000 to 3,000 parts per million. So the environment mammals inherited after the dinosaurs was swelteringly hot, unimaginably hot. There's actually an argument that we're warm-blooded not because it was so cold out that it was an advantage. We're warm-blooded because we didn't, our metabolism didn't blow up in all this heat. Because lizards that are cold-blooded, finding places to cool down would have been a major challenge sure. because it was just too darn hot outside. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the ideas. So the world mammals get is 
phenomenally different than what we have right now. Which goes back to the question that we started this whole thing with of who yeah. survived and why. Mm -hmm. Well, turtles and crocodiles survived because they could be deep under the mud. Exactly. <laughs> Certain <coughs> fishes and other um, sort of aquatic species survived if they could stay underwater mm -hmm. for long enough or come up for those teeny little gasps mm -hmm. of air and then get back down there. Mm -hmm. So and deep that they couldn't need, didn't need to breathe. Important to us, these little teeny tiny mole-like mammals mm -hmm. that were burrowed down 10 centimeters or more into the dust, into the mm -hmm. dirt. I have a photo. They survived. Photo. Yeah, yeah, photo. <laughs> Um, they survived, and why is that important? They are the, the group or the species that eventually speciated enough or turned into enough other things through the incredible process of evolution, which we'll talk about tomorrow, um, it turned into us. And if it weren't for these guys burrowing and surviving mm -hmm. in this particular apocalyptic moment, mm -hmm. yeah. we wouldn't be here yeah, exactly. today. And neither would any other, like your dog wouldn't be here, cat wouldn't be here, mm -hmm. monkeys wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. None of these guys would be here. We wouldn't have this awesome Twitch show. We wouldn't have this awesome Twitch show. None of this would Damn happen. Damn straight. <laughs> so all we need are these tiny little burrowing moles <laughs> to be sleeping in their burrows, mm -hmm. sleep through the apocalypse, <laughs> and wake up to find enough food to survive. Mm -hmm. And they did. And here we are. Yeah. It's like you took a nap and then you woke up and like everything's on fire, but I can still eat, so this is cool. And, yeah, so and, we're gonna be fine. And what yeah. important, one of the food sources those mammals could have used is roots. Absolutely. Because if they were growing, yes. they had the ability to access food mm -hmm. that would have been under that 10 centimeter threshold. So all of that right. stuff that happens in a plant underground mm -hmm. would have been yeah. key mm -hmm. for all of these guys who had also survived because mm -hmm. they were way underground. Exactly. Kind Absolutely. Of, yeah. What Leith kind of talked about earlier was the study of like using pure physics to kind of explain some of these questions. And I feel like it was um, one of the things I loved about this article is like, I don't do dinosaurs, I don't really actually do deep time. Um, but reading this article, they made it really clear about some basic basic things that we think about, like the depth of soil, the depth of water, mm -hmm. and kind of basic sort of physics things that you know where it's like, oh, it takes a certain amount of energy to heat this up. Yes. And thinking about that um, in a kind of really practical way, like 10 centimeters, was like, okay, wait a second, I understand this. So anything below 10 centimeters underwater or under soil was fine. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a crazy thing to think about that like 10 centimeters was all you need to yeah. protect yourself from like yeah, this crazy like thermal blast. Yeah. Right? And yep. it's like, but it's also super prob probabilistic. Yeah. Like, right. like, oh yeah. yeah, I happened to be napping at this time, so I lived. Yeah. <laughs> my, my entire family lived because I was taking a nap at like 4 a.m. Yeah. That's like, the luckiest nap it's, that it's has that ever been napped. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the luckiest the, mole ever. Yeah. Yeah. The paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould calls this contingency, right? <laughs> that like yeah. so much of his, the history of life on Earth is pure randomness. I, I forgot, I hit snooze. I was underground and the asteroid hit, I get the Earth. <laughs> That's, that all, that, and you think about it. It's like you, the you, sleepy inherit the Earth. Like, guys, this so, is what we're born from. <laughs> so for time comparison, this Stegosaurus and this T-Rex, the T-Rex is closer to us in time than the Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus is like 150 million years ago. The T-Rex is 65. And we're over here at the iPhone. Yep. You're off <laughs> off camera. We are still. Okay. Yeah. No, you have to be here. I got him. I got him. Yep. So there you go. That's Relative. that's what you're looking at. So millions Attempted and millions of years of evolution of parents protecting kids and everything, and ultimate survival depended on being 10 centimeters underground yeah. for an hour on a Tuesday when the asteroid hit. It's so, insane when you think about it. If yeah. you guys want to hear more really smart people talk about this idea, um, Radio Lab actually did an incredible episode on this particular article in this particular event. I think it was called Apocalypto or Apocalyptic yeah. oh, or yeah, something I've like that. Oh yeah, I've seen that one. That's and it was, good. From, it was from a year or two ago now, but it's really, really good. So if you're interested in hearing more talk about this particular apocalyptic event, um, yeah. Radio Lab did an yeah. awesome podcast I'll, about I'll it find too. a link to it and I'll share it on our social Perfect. media yeah. tomorrow. It's really yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. really good. It's fantastic. So, so in other words, follow us on social media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the channel is um, awesome. So, super existential question, would we exist if this meteor had not hit? No. Probably not. No. Probably uh, not. Well, not. but that's, yeah. assu that's assuming that another event didn't follow. Right. Or I, think that's, event, I think right? that like, but the yeah. other event might not have had the same dynamics. Yeah, but Maybe being yeah. underground would have killed you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, I, but I think about that, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost, yeah, as, as, it's an existential question, so it's almost impossible to really I know, answer. Right. But this it's like, but like, so if, <laughs> but, so know, if like, if this speculate. didn't, yeah, it's like, if, I think that it's possible, probabilistically, that it's possible. Oh. Yeah. Mm. I think that like, there, yeah. Good, oh, so, fr so Frosty Betrayer asked how that 10 centimeter rule applied to the impact site. 
Probably not no. at all. No. no. If you no. were near that impact site, you were, yeah. you were totally it's, exactly. it's one of those things where we're kind of talking about that um, like all of these things have a component of like space and time. Yes. Yeah. And so it's like when you're by the impact site, it doesn't matter how deep you are, you're fucked. That, that's Sorry. An awesome yeah. It's a great Sorry. question. Yeah. Like, you were evaporating all the shit. But it's one of those things where because it hit on one side of the earth and you're kind of having these effect, effects radiate out around through our atmosphere. If you're on the other side of the earth, if you're eight centimeters, you're probably okay. Like, and, and the other thing to remember probably. is this survival happened more than once, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, a oh, yeah, we were talking about that before. Yeah, what other mass extinctions predates this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the underground guys in the southern hemisphere in Gondwana land was a marsupial. One of the guys in the northern hemisphere... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was Gondwana theory? I thought oh, it's multiterbriculate. Maybe it is. You I can yeah. read the thing. So, so <laughs> real quick, divisions of mammals. We've got three types of mammals today. We've got placentals, who are in front of you right now. We've got marsupials who like Australia that's, a lot. That's the pretend it's a kangaroo. And, and possums. And <laughs> possums in the new world. Pouched ones. Yes. Uh, like the one and, above you. It looks kind of like a possum. Yeah. And then you have monotremes, which is the platypus and the echidna of Australia. Mm. And there they actually a, have eggs. They, right? they lay eggs. They're the mammals that lay eggs. Mm -hmm. The multi tuberculates are the are a little more primitive than even the monotremes. Yes. And the what are multi tuberculates? It's a type of mammal that lived during the dinosaur era. They're, the majority of the mammals we have in the dinosaur era are multi-tuberculates. We even have multi-tuberculates that killed and ate dinosaurs in Mongolia. Dang. So the environment where small dinosaurs, big multi exactly, exactly. So in Mongolia, where velociraptors were, the mammal might have been one of the top predators. The multi-tuberculate mammal because there because never velociraptors seen were actually like only Tiny. like a foot and a half tall. Right? Really yeah, little. Small. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if they're you're actually about this size. <laughs> yeah. It is not an unfair comparison. Yeah. yeah. So you had other um, other raptor species that were much more like what we all yeah. know and love from Jurassic Park, yeah. but they mm. weren't the velociraptors. Yeah, velociraptors right. were really mean chickens. Utah That's raptors cool. yeah. were here on our current continent in, yeah. in Utah and various other about places. four feet high. Would have yeah. been a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. big anyway. enough to do some serious damage. I digress. Yeah. Yeah. But in any case, that's that's the history. So like this this event we're talking about happened a couple of different times. There's also a big division of the birds that might predate this. The family of birds that ostriches are a part of might have been split before pigeons and doves and all the other smaller ones before mm -hmm. this event as well. So all of this is important because it's not just one group who happened to be burrowing that survived exactly. and then radiated exactly. into everything else. There are multiple different lineages that were alive before Chicxulub impact mm. yeah. that all managed to burrow and survive in different ways and all lived through that extinction event to mm -hmm. then radiate into the different mm -hmm. things that we see. And right. it's worthwhile. Right now we're starting to get on sort of the cutting edge of where we don't actually know the answer. There's yeah. different arguments, mm -hmm. conflicting mm -hmm. data. But there's some of them, if you look at mitochondrial DNA, which you get from your mother, that's the, that's the little, mitochondria are a little like, they, they start off from bacteria. The energy warehouses of cells. Energy yes. warehouses of cells. <laughs> you only get them from your mother. Mm -hmm. So you can use them to identify the splitting of lineages. Your dad has no energy. No. no like no, that's no, no energy. No. Sad. No. But, <laughs> but anyway, oh, we promise not to talk about that. Anyway. Mm. Right. <laughs> it seemed like you needed to yell for that. Man, man, I'm not sad okay. that we said that, but Mansplanosaurus had to yeah. say something. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in any case, if you do that mitochondrial clock, primates and bats split off from mammal lineage at 75 million years ago based mm -hmm. on current research. Yeah. So there's a possibility that, uh, that our ancestors that survived this were different than deer and cows, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. That might have been a different mammal Wait, so, bird so, so we're talking about this impact that happened when our Cenozoic That's impact 66 is... 66 million years 66 ago. 66 million years ago. So yeah. this would have been after. After, by yeah. about mm -hmm. 9 Sorry, million years. Make sure yeah. we have that time so the, scale. Exactly. So the lineage that leads to primates already exists at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Possible, possible. Possibly. We don't yes. know for sure yet. Right. There's some some data that says yes, some data that says right. no. Burrowing primates. Right. Yeah. Some burrowing, well, burrowy well, primates. Well, like, true, like, thingy. It's probably yeah. not a primate at that point. No, it's, it's not a primate it's, at it's that It's probably point. this like weird tree it's, shrew moly yeah. type yes. thing. Exactly. And, and that there, is just the common ancestor the, of primates. Yeah. Yes. There is a exactly. species exactly. of shrew that's commonly called a shrew, but it's actually closer to primates. I can't remember. Yeah, so there, there yeah. was an argument for a while that many tree shrews, which are shrews that live in trees, as you might guess, yeah. should actually be classified into the primate group. Right. Yeah. Um, this was this came out a couple of mm. years ago, and for the most part, it was like, no, they're they're separate enough. We shouldn't call them primates. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it but they're also close enough that this was a conversation mm -hmm. that was had amongst yeah. the scientific community. Mm -hmm. So shrews and primates 
are sort of sister taxa, if you will. Yeah. They're they're groups that belong very close together as far mm-hmm. as lineage goes, exactly. as far as biology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's actually a, an interesting thing to bring up is the way that we think about speciation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, when we think about taxonomy, we think about like, oh, there was this big family and then we broke up into little tinier families but the, mm-hmm. the but when we actually look at dna a lot of these kind of breakdowns go away mm-hmm. because as we talked about kind of earlier yeah. in this segment was that it's much more a sliding scale yes. yeah. and so as much as we want to be like group a group b it's more like group a b mm-hmm. and kind of what like you're more a, 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 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly and so it's just this kind of sister thing makes a lot more sense when you think about it as a sliding scale rather than a sharp division and, right. and, and our understanding of evolution changes really based on what type of data you use so mm-hmm. paleontology uh, which i studied when i was younger typically is more about morphology, the shape mm-hmm. of the bones. Because that's what you have to go on. With that's the, the yeah, data. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's what you have. Yeah, that's what you have Genetics is a far better source mm-hmm. for all this information. Mm-hmm. And you end up with situations where the morphology of two animals can be very different, mm-hmm. and genetically mm-hmm. they're similar, and vice versa. You can have mm-hmm. very genetically dissimilar, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yeah. They, no, that goes into and, the what exciting thing did I learn about this previous yeah. segment, which I don't think we're at yet, yeah. but we're going to come back to this close. idea in a moment. Yeah. We are close. Yeah, yes. no, um, that actually reminds me of, I had a student this week who was like, oh, my daughter tested as being in a different ethnic group than me and my husband. And I was like, <laughs> That's crazy because they were talking about like whether or not an, yeah. ethnic, an, an ethnicity could skip, could skip a generation, and I was like, well, if you think about genes as constellations of factors, mm-hmm. maybe it is that the constellation of your genes with your husband's genes, mm-hmm. co- that constellation of factors made it feel like she felt in, she fell into a different group. Mm. And it's a really weird thing to think about in relation to kind of like genes and evolution where it's like because of the way that we construct our data sets, we can come to slightly different conclusions Mm -hmm. because, um, well, A, B, and C together means X thing, but um, A and two Bs together means X thing. But when you combine someone who has ABB and ABC together and their daughter or whatever is ABC, they get grouped into something that's completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And And it's interesting about that though is that ethnicity, if you're specifically talking about the term ethnicity, is a cultural thing. Yep. Yeah. And absolutely. so that exactly. can change throughout time. Sure. Like mm-hmm. you can decide one day that I want to be called X and then two years later, oh, oh I think of myself mm-hmm. a little differently. So mm-hmm. I'm going to call myself Y mm-hmm. now. Um, and so, so the idea of an ethnicity skipping a generation is, is kind of, Funny. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 No, it's it was really su- interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I was trying to think of a way to kind of talk about this with my with my student because it was like it was a really interesting kind of concept because she was wondering about this whole inheritance thing. Yeah. And it's a really interesting thing where it's like the way that we construct our data sets to be looking at modern populations, not right. historical populations, because you're not actually looking at your grandparents. You're looking right. at what sure. modern people right. come from mm-hmm. particular areas. But then it's like your combination of like Poland plus Russia could mean Croatia yeah. because yeah. of the way that we construct right. our data sets and it falls way, into. This um, is, by the way, you, why, you don't, why you can't genetically say, oh, I'm 50% French based on this test. Right. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. the genetic boundaries do not match. Right. It's, yeah, your yeah. national yeah. boundaries, yeah. If you've yeah. taken any of those 23 me whatevers and you're like, oh, this proves that I have German heritage, it doesn't. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's, it can give you a very large geographic grouping, say, like, yeah. Western Europe in general. Mm-hmm. But it, it just, it cannot get more specific than that because because the genes are not more specific mm-hmm. than that. And, yeah. and so if anyone is trying to sell that to you, don't buy it. Yeah, it's exactly. not true. It's not scientifically <laughs> you can make an argument that you don't can see these, You can make an argument you see these groups, but if they are ethnic groups, they're ethnic groups that have no meaning today because they've banished thousands and thousands of yeah. people. Right, because right. That, that ethnic group is different than some sort of scientifically identifiable, in exactly. retrospect, genetic group. Right. They're not the same. Yep. Yeah. 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 That yeah. is a topic for another day. Yes, it is. It is. It is. But a huge topic, for sure. But thinking about kind of the inheritance and like our our ancestors and yeah. that, that, that kind of thinking of it as, a, yeah. on, on, as being on a sliding scale and one that um, our, our boundaries aren't as sharp mm-hmm. um, is I think something that, that's valuable to think about especially Definitely. when we're looking at like things like major events that kill off Absolutely. like you know 90% of species on the earth sure yeah. 75%. 75, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Sorry, not 90%. 95% was at the Permian extinction, which was another thing we were going to Yeah, yeah that's yeah. much worse. Yeah. So if you think that this particular <laughs> apocalypse was yeah. bad, flash back yeah, in time, right. and there was an even worse one, and we don't know why it happened. Yeah. <laughs> so All the apocalypse and still we're here. And still we're here. Still that's we're right. guess, damn lucky is my I'm point. <laughs> you know, the, the comparison point, I think, is you complain about Rebecca's, Rebecca Black's song Friday, you have no idea about Ice Ice Baby, right? Like that's that's what we're talking oh, about. A severely deadly, like horrifying. It's so event appropriate in that we're the Friday episode too. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. God. 
<laughs> well, all right. So, so to wrap things up on this paper, what is yes. the take home message of this paper? Why, why, why should we care that this paper actually exists? If you hear exists? that an asteroid is coming toward the earth, grab a shovel. That's right. That's Ten centimeters lesson. down, Ten take centimeters, home message. Or go to your basement. <laughs> no, good. well, because if you have wood, a ceiling, it would No, you, you pack yourself in. Mm -hmm. You're good. That's right. Yeah. 10 centimeters. I'm getting shovel, but also, <laughs> you also have to be able to breathe mm -hmm. in that 10 centimeters yeah. of soil, so like too. For a few yeah. hours. Yeah. Also, have a giant stockpile of food. Mm -hmm. What about? <laughs> it's not the size, it's how you use it. <laughs> it's like, where you put your 10 centimeters is really what counts. <laughs> Nailed it. Ooh. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we're done. That's no, all. It's, that's, that's the wrap. We can talk like, that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great example of like how a, a little bit and probability can really save your I mean, ass. That's, like, so my my favorite part about this paper, the part that gets me really excited about this paper, is the fact that it emphasizes not only how really random things happen on Earth, but how really random factors influence incredibly gigantic everything sweet, sweet, everything yeah. literally everything yeah. that you know and love on earth today <laughs> happens to be because one of your ancestors was asleep in a burrow 10 centimeters right? under the ground <laughs> like that's crazy and it's incredible it's crazy enough that it sounds like it should be something in a terrible kids movie and it's not it's actually <laughs> scientific truth yeah. and that's amazing to me yeah no it's it really incredible it's just like the idea that like being passed out on a couch could impact like life in the under in the future. Ten it was like, I am, right? I am asleep an under ten, couch. ten yes. centimeters of couch, and like my yes. my children will be the people that survive. Yeah. The, the power of randomness plus the power yeah. of of totally. being in the right naps. Place the right to be clear, naps though, to be are clear, amazing. Though, uh, uh, heat can go through a lot more than ten centimeters of okay. couch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was, I was gonna say, Were like, you if, couching if that it was a bigger else? meteor. Uh, uh, or, yeah. you know, whatever, right. like exactly, maybe that exactly. 10 centimeter, yeah. Right. Yeah. maybe double it just to be yes. safe. I'm just you saying, know. if we find out that like a meteor's really coming out, Tom. Bruce yeah. Willis failed to blow it up. Right, right. Do not go under your couch. Start digging, man. Start it digging. doesn't take that long <laughs> yeah. to dig 10 centimeters down, yeah. that's all we need. As long as it's like a five kilometer exactly. or fewer, smaller diameter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway. Th this brief, I do want to just call out this this comment from Falric earlier, yes. and he said, "Who is a lazy dirt dweller now, Steve?" Said, <laughs> said the mole animal that saved life on Earth. <laughs> totally that would be right. all of us. Totally totally legit. Legit. All of us. Thank you. Totally <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well Thank played. you, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's always like fuck you Steve or thank you Steve. Right. Yeah. One of those two it's one of you thank like, you Steve. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So right. so, th so that is a really good wrap up for our main discussion tonight. So so let's move into our final segment for the evening which is uh, what is the coolest thing you learned this week? Okay. So yeah, it's awesome. Yes. So we were talking about this in the car and I realized I hadn't read science in the last week, which was terrible. But so speaking of our <laughs> 10 centimeters and life surviving things. So apparently you can extract ancient DNA from soils. I saw and this. And that's so amazing. Cool. I so have not looked like, into it yet. Yeah, no, but so I like. Sounds awesome. So I was like looking through, I was participating in this online archaeology Twitter conference this week, and someone was talking about like ADNA and dirt, and I was like, what is this? This sounds cool. So I Googled some more about it, and basically they took all of these samples of sediments and were trying to look for basically DNA samples. And they were able to in find. In sediment, not in, in bone. In sediment, not in bone. Like literally, so you're bone like. Is where we always get it before. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to drill into the bone, you have to like preserve, you have to make sure that like all of your like gene techs were not like fiddling with it or whatever. Um, but they literally were like, hey, dirt, what's in this dirt? And they basically were able to test this dirt for different pieces of DNA. And they separated out like hyenas and mammoths, or well, maybe not mammoths, because mammoths don't live in the caves. But, um, but they were able to separate all of, all of this ancient DNA from like a kajillion years just ago. Just from the dirt. Just from yeah. the dirt and be like, hey, yo, this is Neanderthal. And that's amazing. It's really which amazing. Yes, so which is amazing. So you don't need don't bone, you don't need proof of artifacts. You can just be like, hey, let me check this dirt sample and see and how see old people are. Out here. Oh and who God. was like chilling in this dirt. Which means and that's you, amazing. Which means if you start practicing your asteroid holes, we can find out. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was like, my mind was blown. I'm like, I, I usually study like more recent past stuff, but this idea that I can pick up a clod of dirt and be like, hey, we're Neanderthals chilling in this area uh -huh. and say yes or no is amazing and yeah. absolutely fascinating. And as Falra points out, that's the testing we need to do on our 2033 man mission to Mars. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. yes. Totally. <laughs> I was just Neanderthal mission that. to yeah. Mars. Like, that's we need a test for that shit. Or just any um, DNA, any yeah, of it. Let's any DNA. What we got. But, anyways, it was awesome. So, that's I'm so super cool. happy that I was able mm -hmm. to like Twitter and From find dust out about to this. Dust indeed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, that was awesome. And I'm super happy that that's I learned cool. about that because it's super fun. cool. Cool. Yeah. That's but awesome. It was Marion. So the cool thing I learned today wasn't actually from yet a scientific paper. The paper hasn't been published yet, but there was an interview done with National Geographic, which talked about this hominoid species called Homo naledi, which you may have heard about in the last couple of years. Yeah. It was the species that was found in a really obscure, hard to get to cave in South Africa, and is a little itty bitty tiny guy, but is our species, is our genus, is Homo. And One of us. Homo naledi, and when they first pulled the species up it was it was super exciting because morphologically so by the the shapes of the bones and things like that they could tell that it was part of our genus part of homo but they had absolutely no way to date these bones so they were like it might be three million years old it might be nine hundred thousand years old it might be who knows how old and the the reason why the skeleton or the species would be important really really changed based on how old it was if it was really really old it might be the very first ancestor that led to homo sapiens if it's much earlier on, if it's much more recent, it might be this sort of very small homo species that coexisted like a, with our own species. A branch off. Right. So within this week, um, one the, the scientist who was leading the excavation named Lee Berger um, did an interview with National Geographic that said that they finally have gotten an actual empirical date on these bones and they dated it to 200 to 3,000, 200 to 300,000 years old, which is way, way younger than they had originally postulated about it originally thought that it might be. And the reason that that's important is because our own species, Homo sapiens, shows up at about 200 to 250,000 years ago in Africa. So Homo naledi pretty much is ruled out as being an ancestor to Homo sapiens because it was around at the same time, but is really interesting because it means that this teeny little much shorter Homo species may have been coexisting with Homo sapiens. Um, within this sort of South we African range at the same time. With it. We could have had a little buddy with us, and that's awesome <laughs> because we know up until about, I don't know, 40,000 years ago with Neanderthals or about 17,000 years ago, if you mm -hmm. talk about little hobbit species living on um, the Isle of Flores, we were not the only species of human-like thing mm -hmm. that was living on Earth. That, yeah. It's really weird that we're the only yeah. human-like thing alive now. Yeah, we weren't the um, only smart bipeds chilling around not, the Yeah, globe. not even close. So it's really cool that this sort of shows that even at the time where Homo sapiens were around, we've got this this potential other species of, mm -hmm. of small little hominid yeah. running around. Do we want to address that question? Oh, yeah. Let's address it quickly. <laughs> okay. so, so Wicked Kender, thank you for this question. Um, this has been a huge topic that we've all been talking about recently. Yes. We'll, we'll address it quickly now, but I think we'll actually talk about it in much greater depth on a future episode when we talk about things like migration and stuff like that. So, so yeah, take it away. Let's talk about this new finding. Okay, so they asked about this. Um, if you've seen it in the news, it's this archaeology site that is in here in North America that theoretically is 130,000 years old. Um, and the, the best estimates for when humans, anything like humans, arrived in North America up until this point is at, at this most generous 15,000 years ago. This is saying 130,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pass it over to Lee because he's got quite well, a that, lot. Well, that, that was also this. my thing I learned this week. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Yeah. There, there you go. You nice All right. Two birds. I didn't actually know that. So, Two birds, yeah. one stone. Perfect. Let's yeah. go. I thought you had a different one. Lithics. So, okay. no. so, okay. so yeah. anyway, the, uh, uh, this site is in California. First off, the first thing we all need to understand, so we're all on the same page, this is almost certainly wrong. <laughs> like, let's just start from that premise, because yeah, okay. yeah. it is such a revolutionary change compared to what we think about North America. Mm -hmm. This is not sufficient evidence to change it. We mm -hmm. need bones, much mm -hmm. more direct evidence. Kind of, that, so we're talking about what, yeah. did they, what did they yeah, find? Yeah, what did they find? So what they found were, well, first off, let me just put this out. 
What we need are human bones from that time period, well dated, mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. osteological features that would clearly indicate that mm -hmm. it was back this far. We'll get to why that's important because, in a second. Mm -hmm. What they actually found is basically a kill site, what they think is a kill site. It's what a is lot a kill of site? It's in California. It's in, a, it's in a, a, it's a mastodon bones in California. It's a dead mastodon site. What, go yeah, ahead, as go a ahead. Kill site. Oh, well, so actually, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't actually continue, but so the idea of a kill site is essentially we found like lots of dead animal things going on. And I think that what the article um, was talking about, I actually haven't read it because I saw 30,000 years, 30,000 years ago. 130,000 years, I was like, nah, brah. Like, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't even bring that shit to At this, this time, table. we need full <laughs> information. <laughs> Sorry, um, but it's this, um, idea. So a kill site essentially is like we find a bunch of animal bones and I think that the evidence that we're going off of was where there were marks on these bones that suggested that something other, something strange was going on that suggested that maybe humans killed these mastodon so or this whatever. So stuff that we look for? So they're basically like, like striations or cut marks, things like okay. that, which suggests that there are these kind of regular atypical marks that aren't what we associate with animal remains, so it's such as gnawing, which have particular sort of like square sort of like shapes on bones or sort of natural sort of decay processes, but instead are these like like um, straight, clear, sort of like butchery sort of style marks on bones. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what they found in this article. Um, but like the- They didn't find any any of those though. It's just- Oh, they the, didn't? The bone, okay, sorry. The, the bones are cracked. Okay. That's oh, all okay. it is. Oh, the really? Well, then that's, that's even better. <laughs> um, but it, so um, when we're talking about issues like this where so, um, um, there's this kind of established archaeological culture in North America called Clovis, which people basically use as a benchmark for when um, um, people arrived in America. Most archaeologists believe that there were probably people here before Clovis. Uh, what, and there's when, lots was, when was Clovis? 12,000? I always think of it as 12,000. 13,000. 13,000? Like, like 13, 12, 13,000, yeah. It goes like 13,000, 12,000, and then yeah. Folsom is about 12,000, yeah. 11,000. Yeah. But guy. essentially, there's this benchmark culture where we're like, oh, hey, there's lots of lithic artifacts that clearly couldn't have been made by like animals or random acts of kindness so or whatever. To point out, we're talking about the difference between like 13, like, 12, like 10, 13, 10,000 years ago and like an and order 130. of 130. An like order of magnitude. Huge difference. Yeah, they're going from like, they're literally going in order of magnitude farther back in so the past. So what, what would you need? This is a great question. What would you need to prove that people were here 100,000 years earlier than we're actually we'll yeah. see evidence that people Let's were Let's start here with from. a different question, real quick. How old is Homo sapiens? Like, how old is our it's species? It's 200,000 years old. So we're looking at 100, and where were they at that time? Africa. And, when did they and leave they, Africa? And when did we there. know Homo sapiens left Very Africa? Very shortly thereafter but not that far thereafter. Somewhere around like 150, maybe, somewhere okay. between 150 and 100,000 years ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the the latest data, but there's one that's it's adultu, Homo sapiens adultu in Israel, where they've got evidence that Homo sapiens got out of Africa and into Israel, but then Neanderthals replaced them. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. is yeah, yeah I mean, that's a good example. Well, you have, uh, Homo Israel sapiens, is beautiful because it's yeah. this back and forth between exactly. Neanderthals and Homo mm -hmm. sapiens. But Homo awesome. sapiens species, themselves, yeah. The earliest, earliest we have for Homo sapiens leaving Africa is about 60,000 years ago. They go into India and then into Australia, because mm -hmm. the first habitation of Australia mm -hmm. is Homo mm -hmm. sapiens. We don't have evidence for Homo sapiens in Europe until actually 40,000 years ago with the Aurignacian culture, mm -hmm. which is what starts to supplant the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we know based on that is this could not have been Homo sapiens in North mm -hmm. America if this happened, and I, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not in any way convinced this is what they right, have. Right, but there's yeah. no way that yeah. it's, if, yeah. if it yeah. is a human-like thing, it's not Homo it's sapiens. It's not Homo sapiens. No yeah. 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 So what it's, it's some sort of archaic, archaic yeah. version of Homo sapiens. And so yeah. what existed back then? What other species do we have? We Neanderthals. Have Neanderthals in Europe. Mm -hmm. Denisovans. But Denisovans in Siberia. Mm -hmm. What are Denisovans? Most, a lot of people haven't heard of those guys yet. Denisovans are my favorite. I just, I just talked to my class about this the other day. So Denisovans, we have no idea what they look like, because all we found is a pinky bone and a tooth. And the pinky bone and a tooth, <laughs> when we <laughs> found them, we're like, like, we found super cool Neanderthal remains. And these Neanderthal remains are in this cave this in Siberia. So we can definitely get a DNA out of them, ancient DNA. Yeah. So we should definitely get some great Neanderthal DNA out of these guys. So they did, and then they were like, well, shit, this doesn't look anything like Neanderthal DNA. This is a totally different thing. And because they don't have a really good morphological description of them or like physical description Because of you them, have a tooth. And you have a pinky, tooth and a pinky and yeah. a bunch of genes. <laughs> you don't have a, a scientific name for them yet. Exactly. You've got some like proposed ones and they're not great. So they just call them Denisovans. Um, and probably a lot of the stuff that we're calling other species, a lot of the stuff we're calling Neanderthals, a lot of the stuff that we're calling Homo erectus, which is the other species that we know is in Asia at this time, are probably these 
Denisovan creatures that we just we mm -hmm. can't differentiate because yep. we don't know what to look for mm -hmm. yet. And also this idea that we de we define species as an inability to um, procreate to create like <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah. the, the way that we define species is kind of up in the air. Right. Or, yeah. or this idea that like the the way that we define species is like are you able to like do it with each other and create species that can also do it with each other and create like and, and, kids. And, and, and we, we can't know that. We and we can't, can't know that. Know except, that. Except, <laughs> except for disowned and disobeds. Because about five to eight percent of the genome of people in New Guinea and Australia matches yeah. the Denisovan yes. DNA. Which suggests that yes. like they were probably part they were us. They were just like a different kind of kind yeah. of us. They, they were yeah. able to successfully <laughs> interbreed. <laughs> they were the elves to our hobbits. Like and, and, and hobbits, hobbits <laughs> are the other species that existed back then. Yeah. In Indonesia, mm -hmm. there is a small branch of the hominid family tree. We still don't know how far away they Very separated. small branch. It could be a million years out. But in Indonesia, it's Homo floresiensis, mm -hmm. and we know they made stone tools. Mm -hmm. It's actually a project I work with. I work with a guy now who mm -hmm. does excavation in the Lin Bua Cave mm -hmm. on this. But that's, that's, that's basically our branches, which mm -hmm. means, based on proximity, the almost certain migration pathway from, uh, from, from the sort of old world to the new world, if it happened, which again, I'm not convinced it did, it would have to be either Denisovans or the Hobbits. Because mm -hmm. they're the I've, ones doing At that point now, I'm just yeah. going to throw this in here really quickly. There is a really spectacular conversation going on in chat right now yeah. about the value of conversation in science education, the value of these other sort of educational platforms on YouTube yeah. in science education, mm -hmm. um, and how good any of them are, yeah. and how particularly valuable conversations writ large are for yeah. science, oh, yeah. and how so much of science education so far has been like, I am standing on this platform spouting out my knowledge uh, down to you, yep. mm -hmm. and how there hasn't been this sort of two-way street yeah. to it, and yeah. how things like the Magic School Bus, which came up earlier in chat, which is mm -hmm. awesome, yeah. and <coughs> and things sort of encourage there to be mm -hmm. talk about it, yeah. questioning about it, you yeah. know, things like this no. about it, um, um, and how Twitch is this really cool platform that mm -hmm. allows us to have these sorts awesome. of conversations about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, this this has gone by so fast that now I can't read everything because That's I've also yeah. no, it's awesome. awesome. Wine, but, <laughs> yeah. No, um, this I agree with you guys completely. This, uh, this conversation no, th thing is so important. This was something I brought up in a, in a guest lecture that I actually did because I'm TAing for a class where I was talking about like feminist archaeology and the idea of deconstructing how we have science power, basically. Is that the way that we construct like like this idea that like I'm going to lecture to a bunch of undergrads and tell them what the truth is yes. about science? And right. it's like to a certain degree that's fine because I do have, you know, 10 years of education or whatever. But to a certain degree it is, science is a community. We are still yes. people and we still have questions that we are um, coming to consensus on and that involves people talking to people. Yes. And deciding yes. whether or not the evidence that different people come to the table with is actually valid. Yes. Um, and that kind of bringing us back to our, um, our 130,000 year old people, um, there are these issues of how we define what evidence is brought forth is actually valid. So when I was an undergrad, um, one of my really important professors um, came up with, had the system for deciding whether or not pre Clovis sites, like the one that we've just been talking about, um, are actually valid. And one of them was um, clear evidence of human artifacts, mm -hmm. meaning that like you can definitely look at this rock or look at whatever you're looking, whatever artifact you're looking at and say, yes, Definitely people. Mm -hmm. Not like, oh man, this kind of rock could have fallen off this cliff and created this yeah. thing. It's like, clearly, definitely people. Mm -hmm. Another one was disturbed stratigraphy. So stratigraphy is basically the laying down of like dirt and stuff or mm -hmm. material culture. And basically saying like, yeah, nobody came in and dug this all up and mixed it all up and that sort of thing. So it's clear that like, definitely this, this thing that's really low came before this thing that was really high. It's very clear, it's like visible or whatever. And the third thing was um, uh, reliable absolute dating. So is the thing that you are dating clearly associated with people, clearly in an undisturbed stratigraphic context, mm -hmm. and is the dating method you're choosing reliable to date that thing? Mm -hmm. and, and whether or not this 130,000 year old thing actually matches all of those criteria. Mm -hmm. the, right now the chief criticisms are, first off, undisturbed is probably qualifies here. Like yeah. this does look like an undisturbed stratigraphic sequence. Legit. It is not, the authors spend a lot of time in this paper arguing it is an identifiable stone tool. <coughs> that is really up for debate. Uh, that's, that's, that, that I'm not convincing in the article. Mm -hmm. The problem is their dating method is uranium thorium dating. Ah, uh, so, what, so what is uranium thorium so, dating, Lee? Well, that's the same way we know how old the Earth is. Ah, how old the microbes oh, no are. Way. Uh -oh. So it's, it's basically radioactive uranium mm -hmm. decays over time. Yep. And they're looking at the half-life from uranium to thorium. 
I cannot remember which isotope. That's 235 or 238. I think, I think it's, it's 238. 238. I think it's 238. And it's like, and the reason they, and the reason 238 is the most useful is because that half life is 4.4 billion. Is like. It's no, really, it's really it's long. Like, it's like 13 billion years. It's really long. Like that. So yeah. that means that when we're looking, so a half life is. No, it um, is four billion years. It is four so, billion years. So four years. billion yeah. years. Yeah. So essentially, so um, but a half life is when you have a certain amount of a radioactive isotope, mm -hmm. and half of that is gone at a certain point at in time. So after four years billion later. years, half of the amount of of uranium 238 is gone. Yep. Yes. Exactly. And so you're using this uh, as a metric, yes. and but it, but also this entire thing is a probabilistic. It is. Thing. Yes. And so it's kind of like the average over X number of billions now, of years the, is this. The reason uranium thorium dating is problematic here is if I had a closed system and I had this much uranium. What to is start a closed with, system? And there's no exchange with the outside world. No it's inputs, isolated, no outputs. No, mm -hmm. So the uranium is in a box. And the uranium <laughs> decays in the thorium. <laughs> I can use the thorium uranium ratio and back calculate how old the thing is. Mm -hmm. The problem is this is in a bone. And bones can keep absorbing uranium yep. over time. Yep. So if that happens, you would have an older date. Mm -hmm. But one thing I want to point out, and this is, I haven't seen enough discussion about this in literature about this. If we want, let's, let's, let's take all those issues aside, because these are valid criticisms of the site. When could we design a time period for other hominids to get to North America? 130,000 years ago is exactly the only window that that could happen because of the ice ages. Mm. The only other warm interglacial period we have had since hominids started making mm -hmm. really nice tools mm -hmm. was 130,000 years ago during the Eemian. Okay. We know other species crossed between America and Asia. Mm -hmm. So for example, like cheetahs evolved in North America, in Wyoming. That's why pronghorn run so fast, because that's what hunted them. Yeah. The cheetahs migrated from the Americas over a land bridge into Siberia and eventually mm -hmm. to Africa, mm -hmm. which is why they have such a problem with genetic bottlenecks today. Mm -hmm. and, and they did so about 130 about 100, years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's mm -hmm. in the window. The other species is bison. The bison are, Google bison and Yellowstone, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. They get called buffalo a lot, but they're technically bison. They're an Asian species. What's the difference between buffalo and bison, Lee? I, I do not know water buffalo in Africa near well enough. But bison, they, look, they look super different. Yeah, they look really different. Sure they're different. English, they look super it, different. it's words. <laughs> but bison began in Asia and migrated Isn't this over all to words, It's all words, It's yeah. all words. But bison migrated from Asia over to America around the same window. And all this is to yeah, say, is we know change. there's biotic transfer mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. Eurasia and the Americas mm -hmm. at this time. So it is possible not plausible, not, not, mm -hmm. not probable, but possible that you could have hominids move over here. If at any point they were going to. It has to be this right. time window. It has to be this time window. I think that actually brings up an interesting thing that we don't always entertain when we're talking about um, like human, human ancestral migrations is this yeah. idea that like someone came over and then died. Like we started, we, we like colonized this area, but then we totally fucked up and failed. It failed, exactly. And so it's like, exactly. as much as I don't believe that this is actually a thing, it's possible that like one guy happened to have like the best luck of all, yeah. chill in California for a little while, die, and then all of his fossils were preserved. Yeah. Like that's, that's probabilistically possible. But not likely. But not likely. Exactly. <laughs> and so, like differentiating that like there's the possibility for the there's the potential for these so, things to have happened, but like for the um for this it's kind of like kind of this entire theme of this episode is actually kind of like probability basically. Yeah. Right. The likelihood Absolutely. that like this thing happened in a scale enough that like a cajillion years later we're able to detect it. Right. It's, that it's, it's just it's, so unlikely. It's the hipster archaeology problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> hipster so homeless? Hipsters, hipsters don't want to have the most popular thing, right? No, they want no. to have the least common. Archaeology, you will only find the most common mm -hmm. thing. Yes. Because it has to be common enough and widespread mm -hmm. that there's that small sliver that yeah. it's preserved for thousands so of years like later. Everybody if, had an iPhone so much across the uh, across the, the world that we can actually find it everywhere. But if you have a Samsung it. Galaxy Note 7, <laughs> that one's probably We're not, not going to show up because it blew up. Same uh -huh. thing with Beatles albums. If I've got, <laughs> you're not going to find their demo tapes in archaeology, no. but you are going to find have, the white album. Did they have tapes? They had, they had recordings. Did yeah. they have, did, no, 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 but did yeah. they actually have like tapes? Yeah. Like tape, tape, tape. Like okay. a cassette yeah. tapes. Okay. So, yeah. okay. so they would go and perform okay. to a studio. And they would record it, and they'd say, "No, this isn't. This isn't gonna work, guys." Get, get so there's on. like two of them. Yeah, there's like two sets. <laughs> there's two like plastic Beatles cassette tapes chilling around. But the, but, the, yeah. but but there's so few copies of those tapes. Yeah, it's and a probability. So many copies, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. 
Yeah. Is why hipster archaeology doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Um, on that note, you also have a, a shout out to your Miss Marvel. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to whoever. Yeah. That's so, uh, from Wicked Theater. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, I, I'm out. repping the Kamala Khan. It's a little bit too warm in here to wear a scarf, but if I did, if it was cool enough, I would be wearing one. Yep. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> yeah, thank you yep. for, for acknowledging that Kamala is awesome. Yeah. But yeah, um, thank you. It's, it's in, that's in birth comedy. Yeah. I know it's totally against what we're talking about. But yeah, no, 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 no. It, it was one of those things. Where, yeah, no. I feel like it's also important to kind of like think about what you're wearing when you're yeah. talking about science. Because like, who are you actually repping when you I wear? Didn't when do you that. wear? I really, no, I feel like I dropped the ball true. on that one. It was a bad idea. No, but it's you did, but you did yeah, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was either this or like my resistance shirt. So like, it's fine. That's but good. no, but it's uh, like. <laughs> Wow. That's, a, that's a whole other conversation. Yes. It's like superheroes and science and comics and like advocating for those things. But yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um. All right. <laughs> yeah. So so just to wrap up, we had a couple of yeah. other questions. Mm -hmm. We did have this really fantastic conversation about live streams for science. Oh, yeah. Really. I saw that. That was awesome. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that was really nice. Thank you so much, Loopy Dragon. We we met today during the Science Week panel with awesome. Andrean, Yay! and so 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 thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And actually, I um, didn't I didn't know any of the streams that were mentioned earlier, but I'm gonna me go check them out. Me neither. Yeah, um, I'm totally gonna check them out. I, I feel like the more the more streams available, the better. But yeah. also, you've got to empower <laughs> people to have a way to evaluate the streams that are most Definitely. most mm -hmm. worth looking at. And mm -hmm. those are all on YouTube yeah. too. And so yeah, so what sure. we've been talking about since is that. YouTube is a lot less of an interactive platform. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not live. You have live streaming, but mm -hmm. it's it's much less common. It's mm -hmm. it's the commentary thing, so yeah. it's like harder. So to it's comments. Tap into, like yeah. most most of the videos just have their comments, and and you can talk into it and everything, mm -hmm. but but it's the interactivity part of it is just mm -hmm. not as developed. Yeah. yeah. And no. so so that's kind of our our general mm -hmm. thing is that. We want this to be a conversation with people. We mm -hmm. want it to be interactive. And exactly. So that's part mm -hmm. the one of the main main reasons why we chose to do this on Twitch versus mm -hmm. something like YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. but I really appreciate those the recommendations for Absolutely. those because I really yeah. want to check them out. Yeah, mm -hmm. the yeah. more so the better. The more platforms they're on, the better. The more yeah. accessibility like, they're on, the better. Mm -hmm. Like all science, science needs to be a thing that is talked thing. about. Like, mm -hmm. this, all yeah, the time. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's super cool. It's I think it's also like an important thing with science that sometimes we think of it as this kind of like elite pursuit that only yeah. some people yeah. get to, to participate in. And I think that's like, that's really not what our hope is. Our no, hope is yeah. actually that everybody gets to come to the table and participate in yeah, this definitely. conversation. Yes, um, sure. And and it's really that participation that helps us prove good science, or not prove, or like falsify. Right, uh, right. Falsify yeah. bad science and, like, <laughs> and, 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 and help support, support good science. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Yes. But it's like, it's everybody at the table. And I think yeah. that, that conversation, definitely. and acknowledging that that conversation is really the thing that makes science is, um, is really important. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I think that's kind of awesome to think about too, that the, like this whole this entire platform this idea of twitch came from kind of like gaming and um because i always um there's this really cool um uh, survey that i participated in that was talking about gaming and i and some people were talking about gaming in the in this relationship to um like theater that you're kind of projecting these lines mm. out and i always actually thought about gaming um as improv where mm. you have yeah. this theme that you're given and then everybody who's there whether or not they're the ones with the controller or if they're there just like your your friend chilling with the cheetos who gets to participate in this thing that yeah. you're doing and so you get this commentary of everyone who's here participating in this conversation and getting to create that's this awesome. narrative that's great. and Definitely. i think that it, like because twitch came from that it's so fascinating it's so amazing to be able to apply those things to things like science and discussions like this mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah all right so one final question we already went through what's the coolest thing you learned this week and that's our normal closeout but but Hose Beats has a really, had a really fantastic question a long time ago, and I've held on to it in my brain piece. And it is, if you could have a do-over on your science ed education, what would you have become? Okay, so I'm going to start with this. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot because graduate school makes you rethink everything. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I think all we can life, all relate all, to this. All of your life decisions. So if I had to like a complete do-over, but like I knew everything that I'd learned in the last five years of graduate school was I probably would have been a dual major in geography and computer science mm. because I am fascinated by the way that spatial relationships affect how we understand everything, but also at the exact same time, the idea of like automation and programming fascinates me and it's amazing and like if I could combine like 
geography and computer science and like anthropology into one giant amazing field where we're talking about people and automating things and modeling like that would be my field that's and that sounds would be amazing. amazing like yeah. it just sounds I mean, like like that sounds like something that will be a thing in like yeah 15 years. yeah exactly it's like when i'm a professor i'm going to be starting this department and that's what people are going to be yeah. doing but it's like it's like it's like um, I, I think about this occasionally when I'm like really depressed about my research. I'm just like, what if, <laughs> what if I had taken a computer science like class the like the first year of my undergrad, and that had been the trajectory that guided me? Not that like my first my first like semester of undergrad was bad at all, but it was like, what if I had this complete different trajectory? And it's like it's awesome, and I try to like learn as much as I can about um, from these different fields. But at the exact same time, like I I would have been like. Uh, like a computer geographer that would have been the thing cool. that like set Very me cool. off and it would have been awesome I probably would have been asking the same sorts of questions but I would have had a different sort of toolkit to ask these questions yes. so yes yeah very good yeah, yeah. yeah. Marion so I, <laughs> I said earlier that I probably would have been an ornithologist because I really like birds <laughs> but I don't actually think it's true because <laughs> it wouldn't solve the fundamental <laughs> issues that I find so I love <laughs> birds but I don't I do like love birds, birds. I, ornithology is always going to be my number two <laughs> but my my other number one probably actually would have been something going into something related to like epigenetic research genetic yeah. genetics epigenetics because it it combines my love of studying what happened in the past with this drive that I feel to do something useful pe for people in the present. For sure. So if yeah, we can legit. better understand how the past influences our present health and our present well-being and our present quality of life, I think that would actually be the connection I would really like to be able to make um, to both understand where we came from and then better direct where we are going. That's awesome. That would be. If I had to choose over again, agronomy. <laughs> Wait, like, so, like farming? Farming? I don't know what okay. that means. It's, yeah. it's farming. No, go it's farming. farming. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's agricultural Fancy science. way for fun. Yeah. So the reason for this, As two ag reasons. Ag science. First, yeah. it meets my criteria of involves digging in the dirt. Woo! Second, dirt people. Uh, dirt. My, day, my old day job, which ended about two hours ago, um, I worked with X-ray fluorescence systems to help see elements. What's X-ray fluorescence, Lee? It's, uh, it's way, too, way, way too long to, Dude, to go, to go Paulina, through here. Paulina, you need to be our resident jargon yeah. person. So, to be like, what is this? We use X-ray. Yeah, like we, 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 yes. we use X-rays to see elements. Elements like calcium, phosphorus, sulfur. And seeing how... Not like fire, water, and yeah. air. So it's a magic gun that lets you see what elements make up a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, it, 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 the, the ability to help feed people um, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I can take mm -hmm. this yeah, piece of equipment sure. out, mm -hmm. find out what fertilizer someone needs to do, and that can be the difference between famine or success. That is awesome. Small farm. That is amazing. And seeing the impact of that technology, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's no, answer. it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I feel like once you've been in a science for a while, you st kind of start to realize the importance of really impacting people more than like you and your advisor. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that once you realize that, you're like, I need to do more. Right. Yep. And I think that right. um, that's something that like, um, as you're a certain at a certain point in your graduate school career, you realize that like right. I need to do more to help people. Right. And especially because we're kind of in this really awesome, privileged scientific position to do so, yes. we really need to do that. And I feel like this like I've got thank to you. learn all of this for a greater. Yeah, goal. exactly. Yeah. I think, I, you know, I think this Twitch channel is a great, a great kind of yeah. intro to that. It's a, this yeah. awesome kind of like getting people to interact with our science in a really impactful Absolutely. way. And I think totally, that's awesome. I, it, that brings me to, I'm going to just be the most shameless person ever. <laughs> so box! But like, I, so I, I recently just figured out what the model, motto of our channel is. Yeah. Awesome! And please forgive me for this. It's no. terrible, but also awesome. Yes. Go for it. I love it that. It is that science is a discussion often over drinks. I yes. love it. So That's good. It's empty totally true. It's like, like, like you're <laughs> empty. It's like you get science glasses, is, yeah. is a discussion yeah. over drinks. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, honestly, like that's that's great. Totally true. I love it. Yeah, it's true. I love it. No, it's so it. I think that what's great about that too is that it, it makes the way for things like traditional knowledge to also incorporate yeah. into science that are so often left at the wayside. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that like Absolutely. like it's it's a bunch of people who know a lot of stuff about what's going on, talking about it, and realizing what's like. Yeah, okay, we can all agree mm -hmm. agree that this is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's for sure. awesome, and that's true, and Definitely. that's basically what science comes down to. Yeah, and the discussion part of it is so central to this Twitch channel too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we exactly. have these people in chat who are asking us questions and really engaging with the content. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. so meaningful. It's, yeah, it's it, and I I said it earlier. It's it's the difference between talking at people 
and talking with them mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and exactly. That is a, it's just a totally different thing and yeah, it, it really absolutely. means mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. And like that to me is scientific outreach. Yes. Yep. It's, that's the way it works. Yes. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. It's so true. That's such a good yes. note yes. to yes. episode. Yes. Oh, oh like, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kate, for yeah, having talking. us on here. Yeah, thank you this guys awesome. so much for hanging out. This was so great. Mm -hmm. This we went loved it. really long because it was such a great discussion. <laughs> we had so many good questions. Cheers to you, and so audience. many dinosaurs. Yeah. Like, oh, Woo. hang on, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Let me, b before we go. <laughs> before One more we thing. Go. Okay. You have. You're about to be eaten by Sue. Behind uh -oh, you. Sue. <laughs> So Sue is the famous T-Rex at the Field Museum in Chicago Woo! that that we all know and love. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's behind Marion right now. <laughs> I just wanted to pull pull her up to, mm -hmm. to say hello. Um, hello, we goodbye. Went, but, all of those things. Um, Memory for those we have lost over the past. Mm -hmm. That's right. Years. Yeah. <laughs> R.I.P. Sue. The, the last sixty-five million years, all of those fantastic species. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A moment of silence, yeah. please. <laughs> all right. Anyway, well, thank you guys all for watching. We so, so appreciate it. Thanks this for watching, Science guys. Week has been amazing for us. We've been so thankful to be able to be part of the conversation in all these panels that Twitch has had. It's been so, so wonderful. Happy. And tomorrow we will have another episode of Science Whee! Happy Hour. Tomorrow, drinks, same time at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, we will be talking about evolution, a yes. very, very controversial topic. Um, <laughs> Apparently. We will have it's an equally, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. equally entertaining uh, episode about evolution tomorrow at the same time. So we hope we, we get to see you then. Um, and follow us on Twitch. Follow us on all of our social media. You'll see the, the articles we're going to read during the week, um, other helpful things, live updates, that kind of thing. Um, and we really appreciate it. We have a bunch of... Uh, canine quadrupeds who are coming into the room right now for some love. Um, uh, they don't want to be on uh, camera, they're camera shy. Here we got one. They're very camera shy, Yay! but we'll make it happen. Oh! There's another uh, one! Oh, Yay! Another one. Yay! Ah! <laughs> um, <laughs> they're about to be eaten by Sue. <laughs> I tried um, to pick Sue's dino booger as I was directed to do. There you go. You're pretty, to find you're pretty close to okay. picking the dino booger. It's true. Yeah. So, oh, he's my dad. <laughs> but anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. And we hope we see you tomorrow and again next week on Friday. Um, normally, this show is on Fridays at, at 8 p.m. Eastern. So um, we hope we run into you guys again. Please keep asking great questions. We really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you guys again. Thanks, we guys. will see you, you. next time. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Science. <laughs>